Good morning. The hearing will come to order. And hold on one second. We exist for, for two fundamental for principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine tax reform, or, sorry, genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. Today's hearing is an important one because the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is intended to bring protections to the American people in and around financial products. We are here not to micromanage every aspect of that. The, committee, the Financial Services Committee has a responsibility to look at the details of that. What we are here to do is our oversight role as to government organization, whether or not this agency is properly designed and prepared, whether the funding stream is appropriate and verifiable, whether it will be transparent, whether or not, as it is being organized from a 2,000-page document, whether the guidance has been sufficiently clear, and whether or not the American people can feel comfortable that what was envisioned in Dodd-Frank is, in fact, what they want. We appreciate Pres uh, Professor Warren's willingness to clear her schedule, testifying for the second time before this committee, first time before the full committee. I know the American people want to know more about an agency that you have dedicated in some ways your whole life, but certainly the last year, to building up. The American people do not understand all the history that goes into your preparation for this. And I believe today is an opportunity for us all to get a better understanding of that. Additionally, the definition of consumer uh, financial products protection is one that people don't understand. Quite frankly, it may apply to payday loans, but that wasn't the basis for Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was about making sure that we never again had a meltdown because certain types of credit instruments were unsafe unsound, poorly documented, and ultimately worth less than they were attended to. But it is clear today that we will be dealing with an agency that will be far larger. The budget for next year is estimated to be larger than the two largest consumer protection agencies presently in existence combined. It is a lot of money. Additionally, the authority of this uh, agency is extremely broad. Today we also will ask some important questions that this committee has been dedicated to, along with the Financial Services Committee, for some time. The Federal Reserve is not transparent. The Federal Reserve does resist any kind of congressional oversight and considers it unreasonable interference. There have been limited, and I repeat, very limited, uh, ability to get transparency in some cases related to the financial bailout from the Federal Reserve. It is likely that without specific and documented ability to have guaranteed transparency and legitimate oversight, that this subagency, independent as it might be, but fully funded and accountable to the Federal Reserve, could well become an agency that, well intended, is not well understood or transparent to Congress or to the American people. These concerns and others will be voiced here today. We are delighted to have a witness who, more than anyone, absolutely understands the intention of her, uh, her agency. Often you have used the term cop on the beat. Oddly enough, we use it here, too. Today we will ask the questions that will include, does the cop on the beat have a district attorney overseeing the cop on the beat? Is there, in fact, a defense counsel available 
to check on the cop on the beat? Is there an independent judge of the cop on the beat? Is there, in fact, a court of appeals? And by the way, if I am accused by the cop on the beat, can I get an attorney paid for by the State? These and other questions are important because we are not talking, in the case of your oversight, uh, about only large international banks. We may be talking about a small organization formed for the purpose of one financial instrument potentially finding that product in disfavor with the large banks who complain that that product is in some way deceptive. I have no problem with the idea that that will be looked into by your entity. I do have a question about whether or not that small company will have their day in court and their ability not to be in financial ruin if, in order to save their company, they must disagree with your determination. That and many other issues we will be concerned with. Lastly, there is a concept of individual liberty. One of the concerns that the Chair has, and I believe many members of the Committee has, is at what point does the American people have a, do the American people have a right to say, I want to be informed, I want to be protected by being informed, but quite frankly, I want something which you may not want me to have. In America, unless it is incredibly dangerous to others or may cause harm to society, generally we let people have what they want even if we don't want them to have it. We could use many examples. <clears throat> I will simply quit with adult beverages. Under Dodd-Frank, the CFPB will have the power to regulate all consumer financial products and to prohibit the ones it deems unfair or abusive. Today, I hope we will be able to understand what under Dodd-Frank is the scope created by that language and others. I appreciate, again, your being here, and I yield to the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Professor Warren, for being here today. And at today's hearing, we have a fundamental difference of opinion about what we believe is important and who we are here to serve. The difference can be distilled into one simple question. Whose side are we on? On one hand, are homeowners who have been illegally evicted, foreclosed on, and charged inflated fees. They include thousands of U.S. military service members and their families who lost their homes, were charged millions of dollars illegally, and were subjected to other abuses in violation of Federal law. The Chairman asked a question about someone having a day in court and facing financial ruin. They did not necessarily have their day in court, and they have faced financial ruin. Many of these service members are deployed overseas. Their credit has been impaired, and their security clearances have been suspended. While they are fighting to defend our nation abroad, they are also fighting their banks back home. Professor Warren is on the side of these service members, these homeowners, and their families. Holly Petraeus, the wife of General David Petraeus, is now working at the Bureau as the head of the Office of Service Member Affairs to educate service members and banks about their legal rights and obligations. They have joined with our nation's top uniform lawyers, the Judge Advocate General, to protect service members from the predatory practices of these banks. I, too, am on the side of service members and other homeowners across the country who have been the victims of these illegal, and I emphasize illegal, actions. In my opinion, none of our troops fighting overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else should also have to fight illegal actions by their banks back home just to keep a roof over the heads of their loved ones. And by the way, a number of these illegal actions have already been admitted to by the banks. Over the past six months, I have urged this committee to conduct a thorough, thorough bipartisan investigation of these systemic abuses. Initially, we had positive signs 
On February 11th, we formally adopted the Committee's Oversight Plan, the blueprint for our Committee's investigative priorities. As part of that plan, we voted unanimously to investigate, and I quote, wrongful foreclosures and other abuses by mortgage servicing companies, end of quote. We also held a bipartisan field hearing in Baltimore, where we heard heart-wrenching testimony from a disabled veteran who suffered abuses at the hands of a mortgage servicing company, including an illegal eviction. But since the hearing that, the hearing that testimony, the committee has done nothing. I ask the Chairman to join me in sending document requests to the top 10 mortgage servicers, but he declined. So I sent them to myself. I asked the Chairman to invite J.P. Morgan to testify about their illegal foreclosures against service members, but he declined. When some mortgage servicers refused to provide even a single responsive document, not a single syllable, I asked the Chairman to issue subpoenas, but he declined. Instead of conducting a bipartisan investigation to help service members and other homeowners, this committee has now trained its eyes and sights on Professor Warren, who is trying to protect these very same families so that they may have, in his word, they, their, their day in court, so that they might not fa face financial ruin. Ironically, it appears that the majority's single biggest, biggest criticism of Professor Warren is that she is somehow being too hard on these mortgage banks. Professor Warren has now been summoned to testify before the committee not once, but twice. And the committee has demanded that she produce a massive range of documents, all while the mortgage banks are given a pass. So let me end with my original question. Whose side are we on? The side of service members risking their lives and their safety and their health? Are we on the side of other homeowners and their families? On, or the side of the banks that are committing violations against these folks, and these are violations that they have admitted to. I hope we can come together and work with a common purpose to do what this committee has the opportunity to do best, to help millions of American families improve their lives by demanding accountability and compliance with the law. I have often said to my constituents, we have one life to live. This is no dress rehearsal, and guess what? This is that life. I do believe that Professor Warren is doing her very best to make sure that every American lives the very, very best life that they can. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on TARP, Financial Services, and Bailout of Public and Private Programs, Mr. McHenry, for his opening statement. Thank and, by, and by previous agreement, any unused time you may yield uh, on our side, and they will do the same. Thank you. Recognize the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we sit here today, the economic health of the United States remains fragile. Unemployment numbers continue to be unacceptably high, while small businesses struggle to access credit and families struggle to simply pay their bills. With that in mind, this committee remains committed to examine the economic tradeoffs of current and proposed regulations and to define the limits of regulators in an effort to put this country back on the path to growth and prosperity. In the spirit of this process, the House Oversight Committee again welcomes Professor Warren, who has led the formation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, set to launch on July 21st. Although the CFPB is not directly subject to congressional appropriations, I hope that uh, our witness will be forthcoming to Congress and the American public about its processes, decisions, and budget today and for years to come. It is not a secret that the activity and formation of the CFPB has been controversial. Numerous questions regarding the scope of the CFPB's activity in the mortgage settlement case and the Bureau's regulatory limits remain unanswered. With the CFPB's inauguration next week, it is imperative that Professor Warren explain to this committee and to the American people the specifics regarding activities of the Consumer Protection Agency as of today and its broadly defined authority to regulate access to credit. We all agree that protections are needed. In fact, one of the CFPB's first initiatives is nearly identical 
to the Mortgage Disclosure Simplification Act that I introduced along with uh, a Democrat Congressman Green of Texas. It was a bipartisan piece of legislation. So uh, that is a positive. With that said, the majority of rules and regulations coming from the CFPB will not be based on bipartisan ideas and will never require a vote. That is a concern. It will be conducted by a single regulator, single director, who will be given authority to author the terms for access to credit for the American consumers and small businesses. With meager oversight, they will be left outside the window of congressional appropriations. To make matters worse, Professor Warren has continued to evade questions about the types of financial products that the CFPB would ban or restrict. Businesses and investors are sitting on the sidelines due to regulatory and economic uncertainty. There are many questions left unanswered. What will the CFPB do? How will it proceed? And what are the costs incurred by the American consumers for these regulations? Because there will be costs. Professor Warren's evasive non-answers only further contribute to this climate of tepid investment and slow job growth. I fear that the actions by the CFPB that limit access to credit and increase its costs will only further damage a struggling economy. The only clear thing about the CFPB in its current form is that it will have extraordinary reach and control over individual consumer decisions while having an unparalleled lack of oversight and accountability by the American people. As Professor Warren continues to work to stand up the CFPB by next week, it is the Oversight Committee's obligation to continue to ask the questions of the Bureau to be clear about its regulatory limits and proposals to restrict access to credit. I look forward to addressing these issues and many others today with Ms. Warren. And uh, I thank Ms. Warren for returning and uh, being here today and answering members' questions. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield the balance of my time back to you. Thank you. And, and I won't use it for further opening statement, but I would like to answer the ranking member's inquiry. Uh, as you know, we held a field hearing in Baltimore on the mortgage crisis. And I hope that hearings held here are not somehow weighted greater than those held in your own district with your mayor and your governor uh, there for the same fact-finding. Uh, the time of the committee is limited. We are trying to uh, do things which, in this case, financial services should be the lead. If they are not, we certainly want to make sure that we fill in any of the gap. Originally, I said we were not going to let this go. We are not going to let this go. We are going to continue to look at those abuses, whether it is a government nexus or whether we believe this committee can make a difference. And I want to reiterate, nothing has changed from February till now. Uh, and I would hope the gentleman would realize that uh, I am happy to continue working on specific opportunities. Uh, in the case of the mortgage in this, you know, industry, in your opening statement, you did say illegal, admitted, et cetera. If we already know something is illegal, if, in fact, it is already known and prosecution or corrections are being made, then it is appropriate for this committee to say, what more do we need to do? And if the answer is nothing more there compared to other areas where people are not admitting or not, uh, in fact, known to have done wrong, we are going to choose to go to those who are still hiding behind a veil of, we didn't do it, we are not wrong. And I would hope that both of us would always put our investigations first on those who are saying there is nothing wrong or on government agencies. And I, again, will join with the uh, ranking member. At any time, if we see a wrong that is not being righted that we can help make right, I look forward to working with them. I recognize Mr. Tierney for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Warren. Let me welcome you and thank you for your dedication to the interests of the American consumer. I think you are doing an excellent job on that. You know, the cost for lack of, uh, of regulation is certainly uh, pretty clear to all of us. It culminated in the recession that we have been suffering through for some time. It is amazing that some people in both branches of this legislature seem to be flacking for Wall Street banks, attacking what an entity that has been set up to be the champion of the American consumer and the taxpayer. Some seem bent on sabotaging Dodd-Frank consumer taxpayer protections in order to cover for the Wall Street banks who most of America believe 
wrecked our economy, got a taxpayer bailout, sometimes two, who built nothing of value for America except for financial products that ended up bilking the American public. Uh, and since there's, then, there has been too little legal, moral, or financial reckoning by these wrongdoers, and frankly, the lack of accountability for these greed, this greed and misdeeds is stunning on that. So I want to add some comments on it, reiterate what the Ranking Member talked about in terms of foreclosure abuses that hit service members particularly hard. And this is one thing that this committee can continue to do because it is an ongoing matter. As the Ranking Member of the National Security Subcommittee, I understand that readiness can certainly be affected by troops who struggle to deal with issues back home, when that includes negative credit reports, security clearances that are suspended, and worst of all, losing their homes due to the illegal actions by banks. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a report compiled by the Democratic staff entitled Fighting on the Home Front, the Growing Problem of Illegal Foreclosures Against U.S. Service Members. I look forward to it. Thank you. The report describes in detail the systemic nature of these problems. Particularly troubling is that these abuses are already illegal. Congress enacted the Service Members Civil Relief Act to protect our men and women in uniform against foreclosures without court orders and against inflated fees. This report finds that when initial accounts of illegal foreclosures began surfacing, the banks downplayed these problems. But as thousands of affected service members were identified, it became clear the problems were more widespread. This year, three banks were forced to pay multimillion dollar settlements related to these abuses. The largest was J.P. Morgan. At first, it announced it would pay $2 million, but it ended up paying $56 million to settle claims by active duty military personnel. Justice Department officials also condemned the actions of the Bank of America. This is what they said, and I quote, The bank failed to protect and respect the rights of our service members, failed to comply with clearly mandated procedures, and foreclosed against homeowners who are valiantly serving our nation. I want to thank Professor Warren and Holly Petraeus, who have been working hard on this issue at the Bureau. Uh, since these illegal actions are so much more widespread, Mr. Chairman, than originally thought, however, I believe a comprehensive investigation by this committee is urgently needed. And with that, I yield to Mr. Quigley for the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Professor Warren. Um, with due respect, I fear that this hearing is focused on issues which distract from the obvious task at hand, helping Professor Warren and others in our attempts to avoid another economic catastrophe caused in large part by unregulated greed. Uh, on one hand, we are trying to balance things here, and we are balancing a known entity, the greatest economic downturn since the Depression caused by this lack of regulation versus the concerns about what an agency is going to do whose full effect doesn't go into place until later this month. So if we balance this, I think the American public recognizes the real concern out there is what we have gone through, what we are still experiencing because of those problems, and how to face them, rather than some e extraordinary concerns about an agency which really hasn't done anything yet uh, to challenge those uh, concerns that we have faced so far. And like any agency, the CFPB needs vigilant oversight from Congress, but we should not obstruct the agency from carrying out the intent of Dodd-Frank. As I said, millions of Americans are still suffering the consequences of housing and financial crisis, um, which was caused by weak or nonexistent regulation. We all here have the beauty of hindsight about what took place, but let's remember what, what Professor Elizabeth Warren said in 2007. Nearly every product sold in America has passed basic safety regulations well in advance of reaching store shelves. But credit products, by comparison, are regulated by a tattered patchwork of State and Federal laws that have failed to adapt to changing markets. The CFPB was explicitly designed to address these regulatory shortcomings. Just like the Consumer Product Safety Commission protects consumers against exploding toasters, this agency will protect consumers against faulty mortgages. One key strength of the CFPB is to focus on the shadow financial services sector. And that should be a focus today instead of concerns about what we might do. These unregulated lenders will for the first time be held to the same standards as banks and credit unions. This should be our number one priority. And I thank Ms. Warren for her efforts so far and in the future. I thank the, <clears throat> I thank the gentleman.
members will have one Chairman. moment. Members will have seven uh, days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. What purpose of the ranking? Mr. Member? Chairman, I have a motion. Uh, the gentleman will state his motion. Mr. Chairman, since a listening to your statement a few moments ago, and since the key focus of today's hearing is the abuses by mortgage servicers, I move pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2K6, that the committee authorize subpoenas for documents from the five mortgage servicing companies uh, that have not been responsive. By the way, Mr. Chairman, uh, you said uh, that there were some, you were right, that there are some that have admitted wrongdoing. The five that we are talking about have uh, not admitted wrongdoing. Uh, and I think that it would be appropriate, based upon what we have done in other cases, just like you said, we want to make certain things a priority, those things that, uh, that we need to continue to look into. I think this is an appropriate situation for us to look into it. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> uh, at a hearing, only motions for subpoenas related to that hearing can be considered in order for witnesses. Uh, however, we will take the motion, work with the ranking member on a business meeting where it could be in order. Well, we have consulted carefully with the House parliamentarian, and they tell us that under Rule 11, Clause 2K6, this motion <clears throat> is in order and must be recognized. Under Committee and House rules, we notice business of the committee differently than hearings. Today we have not noticed any business of the committee. So although members would be advised that if a witness had not shown up, a subpoena could be in order to compel that witness, no other business would be appropriate. I will work with the ranking member to notice a business meeting so that it would be. At the next business meeting, including the markup of a post office, it would be ordinarily in, uh, in order for that. Very well. Mr. I thank Chairman? the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, yes? I would like to appeal the ruling of the Chair. If the gentleman insists on his motion, we will take a five-minute recess. We I stand in recess.
Hearing will come back to order. Mr. Tierney, I have consulted with the House parliamentarian, and he informs me that under hearing procedures, which is throughout the 800 pages, uh, at page 802 and beyond of the House Rule 11, which you have referenced, if you look at hearing procedures, what it says is it goes through paragraph 5 of what is in order, which is not included in what you have asked. And then uh, paragraph 6 says, except as provided in paragraph 5, the chair shall receive and the committee shall dispose of request to subpoena individual or, sorry, in additional witnesses. Do you have an additional witness? Yes, sir. If you uh, look at the subpoenas, we are moving the subpoena to the custodians of the record for the five banks to produce the listed documents. And what would that have to do with today's hearing? Uh, no. it, it is additional witnesses for the hearing that has been noticed. Right. So the ranking member's motion here is, is relevant and germane in the following way. It, what the part? title of today's hearing, all right. But no, no, just no, before I'm you no, no, I'm going to answer Well, let's get to quote. the first question. It says witnesses. Yes. Your, your subpoena is for documents. It is for the custodian of the records to bring the documents. It is for documents. It's it for is the for the custodian of the records to bring them in. It is for documents, not witness. Mr. Chairman, I have been through this a few thousand times in my life, all right, and I don't know about you. But it's the subpoena is to the custodian of the records for the documents. But the custodian is the one we are subpoenaing in here to produce the documents. So the I want to understand your subpoena. So what you want is 10 bank executives to be here with documents. I don't know if they are executives or not. I want the custodian of the records. So you don't want here. documents. You just want the custodian. Okay. What part of the English language, sir, don't you understand? We want the custodian of the records to bring the documents here. That person will be the custodian of those records and is the appropriate person to produce them as a witness under oath in front of this committee. That is what the subpoenas are for. I appreciate that. Okay. I have been Chairman. additionally in, uh, in I, pardon me. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, since there is some question as to uh, what the uh, our motion is all about. Uh, Mr. Tierney is absolutely correct. We are talking about the custodian of the records, and we are not talking about 10 or 12 banks. We are talking about five banks, and we are talking about the five banks where the uh, ma minority requested information, and these banks did not provide us, Mr. Chairman, with one syllable of uh, information. And, and the, the relevance is, Mr. Chairman, um, we have before us uh, Professor Elizabeth Warren and the, uh, her bureau, the bureau that uh, she has been putting together and is working so hard on. Uh, part of their task is to look at uh, mortgage issues. And you said a little bit earlier that, uh, that with regard to financial services, they do, they're doing the same thing. They have basically been tasked with looking th at things prospectively, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are looking at them uh, from a historical uh, standpoint. And so that is what it is all about. Okay. Uh, I, and I appreciate the gentleman's comments. Okay. Uh, additionally, the parliamentarian informed me that a appeal of the ruling of the chair, although in order, is not immediately votable under the rules. So we will continue this hearing, and it is my intention before the end of the hearing to hold a vote on your appeal of the ruling of the chair. And with that, parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chair. The ranking member. Thank you very much. Just one quick question. At what time, uh, at, uh, based upon your understanding of the uh, parliamentary rules, uh, is that will we have an opportunity to debate uh, our motion? You follow me? In other words, you are talking about? An appeal is not debatable. Okay. And so, so basically, we will not have an opportunity. It's my Mr. understanding, Mr. Chairman, that certainly is debatable. An appeal of the ruling of the chair is debatable, and we get to discuss the germaneness uh, of that motion that was made by the ranking member. I'm happy to do it now, if you like, or if you want to set it I'm, aside for later, we can do it later. I have set it. it I have set it aside for later. Uh, the parliamentary, parliamentary, parliamentary office of the uh, the House is available to all members. We will have plenty of time. We'll them fully. Uh, we will have plenty of time for you to check on what they just told me. And with that. Mr. Chairman, just one quick question. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, Rule 5 requires that if a vote is postponed, as, as you are doing, 
you shall take reasonable steps to notify members as to when that vote will be held. Pursuant to this rule, I ask that you provide all members with at least half an hour notice before holding a vote on the pending motion. It will not happen before 1040. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Parliament at this point, parliamentary Chairman, inquiry, Mr. Chairman, Professor Warren, parliamentary uh, inquiry. I appreciate inquiry. your being here. Pursuant to committee Mr. rules, Chairman, all witnesses will Mr. be Chairman, sworn before testifying. Please rise Chairman, and raise, raise your right hand. Point of parliamentary procedure, please. Please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please have the record Chairman, reflect that the witness recognize. answered in the affirmative. Mr. Chairman. Professor Warren, Mr. Chairman, we have I a have number a of, of, of items which are obviously pending. Inquiry. I want to and will allow you to go through your full opening statement before we deal Mr. with Chairman. business unrelated to today. So, I have a uh, parliamentary inquiry. Uh, the ordinary rule of the committee is five minutes. Your opening statement is in the record in its, com in its totality, and what we will do is not look at the clock very carefully. Obviously, if you are summarizing or have additional items, we want to hear them. Today is about hearing what you have to say, your vision for this Bureau. And with that, the gentlelady is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify about the work of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We appreciate the committee's important oversight role and welcome the opportunity to respond to your interest in how the Bureau is being organized and operating. Let me begin by assuring the committee that at the CFPB we are working nonstop to build an effective organization with the goal of making consumer financial markets work better for consumers and work better for financial services providers. We want to make prices clear, and we want to make risks clear, and we want consumers to be able to compare two or three credit cards or two or three mortgages head to head. We are opposed to complicated forms and fine print. We believe they do not help consumers, and they do not work for responsible lenders who are happy to have their products compared head to head in a competitive market. At the end of the day, we think every consumer should have the basic information they need to answer two basic questions. Can I afford this, and is this the best deal I can get? That is how markets are supposed to work, and that is where this new agency is headed. We have all seen the consequences of a regulatory system in which no single regulator has the authority and the comprehensive tools necessary to ensure that consumer financial markets work for American families. For years, we have seen the growth of fine print that hides important and complex terms, fine print that makes it almost impossible for consumers to know what they are really getting into before they sign on the dotted line. We have also witnessed an explosion of high-risk credit consumer lending among largely unregulated companies, such as payday and car title lenders. And we have seen the economy driven to the brink of collapse by subprime lenders peddling high-risk mortgages to people who couldn't possibly repay them. As a country, we are all paying a high price for a broken consumer credit system. The CFPB will increase accountability in government. Under the old system, seven different Federal agencies had bits and pieces of consumer financial protection. But no one had the authority and the comprehensive tools necessary to monitor whether prices and risks were clear and to ensure that consumer financial markets work for American families. In the wake of the worst financial disaster since the Great Depression, the Dodd-Frank Act reformed this flawed regulatory structure by placing consumer financial protection responsibility squarely on the CFPB so it can be directly accountable both to Congress and to the American people for getting the job done. In my written testimony, I describe in detail our achievements to date in standing up the new Consumer Financial Bureau. We have made significant progress in our efforts to combine two complicated mortgage disclosure documents into a single short form. 
We are laying the groundwork to supervise non-bank lenders, which will give better protection for all families and help level the playing field between banks and other kinds of lenders. We are setting up our Office of Service Member Affairs under the very strong leadership of Holly Petraeus. We have put the basic building blocks in place for a functioning agency, hiring approximately 400 employees from diverse backgrounds. We have people who are coming to us from financial services, consumer advocacy, community banking, government service, private legal practice, and regulatory compliance. And we have kept stakeholders informed every step along the way. I have talked directly with community bankers in all 50 states. I have spoken with literally dozens and dozens of credit unions and credit union officials. I have also spoken with big bank executives, with trade associations, with government watchdog groups, and with consumer advocates across the country. I am pleased to report that our various initiatives on improving mortgage forms, supervising non-bank credit businesses, and setting up a strong military service office have received widespread support from both individuals and groups across this country. In my written testimony, I also describe in detail the steps Congress has taken to provide meaningful oversight over the CFPB and to make sure that it remains accountable both to Congress and to the American people. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss that oversight today. So with that, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, thank you again for inviting me to testify about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. As we prepare this agency to begin its various responsibilities, we appreciate the important oversight role of the committee, and we thank you for your interest. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, with that, I will recognize myself for five minutes for a first round of questioning. Uh, as you know, I am not on financial services and never have been. So uh, I am going to try and just do some business of the committee that I am particularly interested in. Uh, although both you and I use the term, you know, cop on the beat. Uh, I received from uh, Kim Wallace in your Legislative Affairs Department, I received a, a rather interesting response to our document request, which you had, uh, you had, you, uh, or actually, one second. Okay. Uh, and we are going to leave you with a copy of it. We are just, we are a li little, it, 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 I don't, I think he works sort of for you through Treasury. No, no, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. He, he doesn't work for me. He okay. works for the Secretary of the Treasury. Okay. Then as part of the Treasury, we have okay. A, well, the documents though that we requested, we requested from you. Uh, and no, what we'll do is we'll give you a copy of this to take back because what we don't mind that we need to work through document requests. We've gotten about 300 pages uh, from what we asked for. The gentleman said that it was voluminous, but we actually only received about 300 pages, most of it public. But Justice said that some of the documents we requested, uh, uh, Department of Justice has concerns about responsive records that may implicate the Department's uh, equities. The Department has advised us that disclosing some of these records would adversely impact ongoing law enforcement uh, efforts. Now, just for you, uh, Professor Warren, you are not in law enforcement. You are not involved, you wouldn't be involved in things which are criminal investigations at this time by your agency, would you? Uh, no, Congressman, I, Mr. Chairman, I am sorry, but I'm, I'm afraid there's, there, there may just be a little bit of confusion here, and I want to make sure we don't, we don't get down the, the wrong path here. I, I believe there are requests to the Department of Treasury. It is not okay. to us. Well, well, the problem is, is that you are not stood up yet. So we, we put it to the agency that is custodian of your records. Let me go through a couple more. Then, again, uh, we are going to have you take these with them, because come July, we, uh, late, late, what, what's the July? 21st. Uh, it is a week from today. A week from today, uh, you are going to inherit these, these things. Uh, during this intervening period, FOIA requests have come in from uh, Thompson West and from Judicial Watch. And they have been apparently pretty inadequate, so inadequate that uh, Judicial Watch uh, is appealing the CFB, uh, CFPB's 
search for productive records stating that uh, it was an abuse of uh, disclosure. The problem is they received, uh, Professor, they received these documents. Actually, that's not the, yeah, that's their letter. And uh, Professor Warren, Somebody? That work? I'm sorry. they received documents that looked like this. And when you take over and have a FOIA department, I guess, under your control, what I'd like to, to let you know is that when, you, when someone redacts something so that you don't know what was redacted, you don't even know wh what page it's from, from what request, that's considered excess under FOIA. You, you, have to, you have to find a way to make sure that when you deliver a paper with nothing on it, that you're able to tell those who asked what that is responsive to. And uh, literally, uh, in the case of Judicial Watch, what they received were countless pages. They received not as many pages as they should have, but they received countless pages like this. In the case of Judicial Watch, the State AGs have given them the information that justice on your behalf wouldn't give them. So they have two pieces of paper. They have the one that's responsive, and they can see why they have a right to it, and they have a black page. So a week from today, you are going to inherit an agency where you are going to have a claim by a number of, of you know, transparency groups who are saying, hey, we have got the document unredacted. You redacted it over at Treasury so much so that you violated the law. That is going to be one of the first things on your, uh, your table. And, and we'll, like I say, I am going to give them to you today. My question to you is, will you please address them immediately and report back to us on how you have resolved the inconsistencies between what State AGs under their FOIA laws thought they had to give and what Justice on your behalf didn't give? Please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have never seen this. But, but I do want to say, Mr. Chairman, we will do our best here, but I am not sure I can explain or will be in a position to speak for the Justice Department. Now, actually, what I am what asking you to do is you are going to inherit those requests and those appeals. Yes, sir. You can resolve those appeals by having your, your own FOIA people go back through the document request and fully comply, or you will inherit the appeal. Uh, I am sure Justice is not going to continue defending on your behalf their bad decisions. So what I would like to know is will you look at them immediately, because these FOIA requests I think are going to speak pretty loudly to whether or not the transparency that you speak of, that we speak of, is actually occurring. And sometimes the best example is of transparency is do you give all you can give when FOIA requests come in asking for it? Or do you hide behind every possible redaction? And FOIA officials have a considerable amount between what the law absolutely requires they put out, which in this case, Judicial Watch, having unredacted forms, is saying Treasury violated the law, and what is full and complete and transparent, and you could give out by saying we are going to give all we can. Your agency, not being a law enforcement agency, not dealing with current criminal activities as a general rule, hopefully will be able to give more, not less. Please. I, I, my only, I am afraid I am just a little lost in the conversation because I am not sure what the FOIA request was for, and I had not seen. For documents related to your activities during well, the lead up to the formation. But, but I am not sure which documents you would be talking about or what the subject matter is, or whether it is a subject matter in which the Justice Department has, has um, indicated it has some interest. We, we have many activities, and I, I will say, sir, uh, we have had a lot of FOIA requests, and I, I believe we have answered FOIA requests. Uh, we have had a, I'm, I'm, we've hired people who understand FOIA, and it's my understanding we have been putting out a lot of documents on FOIA, most of which the Justice Department has no interest in one way or another because they do not involve an ongoing law enforcement matter. Well, thank you. And My, so, ahead, I'm please. sorry, sir. No, no, I'm sorry. I just want to be respectful of the time. The ranking members. Your name is not Geithner, is it? Uh, is it? No, sir. Uh, well, the, the request that he's talking about, Chairman's talking about, it says it's dated June 20, 2011, and it's, it's addressed to Timothy Geithner. And I don't want the press to get confused. Uh, and to get the, there is an implication that you were trying to hold back documents. You didn't try to hold back anything from this committee, did you? No, sir. Very well. Professor Warren, you recently came to Baltimore 
for a town hall meeting where uh, many of my constituents were able to learn about the Bureau and share with you their issues. Uh, and we heard from a veteran who was illegally foreclosed on and a retired steel worker who was tricked by a phony debt consolidation company. Uh, these are real people who work hard, play by the rules, and expect others to do the same. And by the way, they are the constituents of, Mr. of Chairman Issa and every single member of this committee. They are the same kind of people that I'm, I guess you have seen all over the country. Uh, what struck me most about the town hall meeting, however, was uh, the overwhelming excitement. And I don't know if you know it, but they literally had to turn people away. Uh, one local, several local papers said that you were treated like a rock star. I don't know about that, but uh, they said it. How often do you see our constituents, uh, uh, and how, how have you been moving around to get to gather information? Can you tell us about that very briefly? Because I have a number of questions I want to ask you. I, I, I can, uh, uh, Congressman Cummings, and I, I appreciate just even the brief opportunity to do this. One of the most exciting parts about setting up the new Consumer Financial Bureau has been to be able to spend time talking to Americans around the country. And these are Americans of all political persuasions, Americans of all ages, Americans of all races, who say, this is a real chance to see government work for me. This is a chance to have somebody on my side. This is a chance to have a voice in a world in which it is all run by big companies who want to drown me in fine print and tricks and traps and surprises that always keep me down. I think we have a real chance with this agency, and it is a chance not only to help markets work better, but a chance really to restore hope for many Americans who are starting to Well, what I heard from folks is that they said uh, basically what you just said. They are just glad that they have somebody looking out for them. They said the banks are doing okay. They are making rock, rock, uh, record profits. Um, but they want to do okay. And sadly, so many of them are drowning. Now, let me ask you about the mortgage abuse issue. On April 13, 2011, the Office of the Control of the Currency, the Federal Reserve and the Office of Thrift Supervision and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation issued a report finding widespread problems at 14 mortgage servicing companies. Let me read uh, the major finding, and I quote, the weaknesses at each servicer individually or collectively resulted in unsafe and unsound practices and violations and violations of, of, of Federal uh, law and State law requirements. The results elevated the agency's concern that widespread risk may be presented to consumers, communities, various market participants, and the overall mortgage market. The servicers included in this review represent more than two-thirds of the servicing market. Thus, the agencies consider problems cited within this report to have widespread consequences for the national housing market and borrowers. Professor Warren, and that is the end of quote, Professor Warren, these are massive and, and systemic weaknesses. When the Bureau is up and running, what role will it play in addressing them? Well, it's, um, I think the best way to understand it is that we will be on the front line. And the question is what kind of mortgages get fed into the system on the very front end. Uh, is it possible to use mortgages to surprise people, to trick people, to drown them in terms that no one understands, so that consumers are neither able to ask the question, can I afford this, and is this the best deal I can get? Our job is to be there on the front end, and we are taking enormous strides in that direction right now, to make sure that in the first instance mortgages are clear, people can tell what they can afford, they can shop in a competitive marketplace. It is also our job to be there throughout the process, including at the end in mortgage servicing, if there are problems all the way through default and potentially foreclosure, to make sure that the large financial institutions that handle these transactions are complying with the law. That will be our job, sir. Now, with respect to service members, the report found that cases in which foreclosure should not have been uh, proceeded, including against borrowers who were covered by the service members. Civil Relief Act. However, this review was based on only a sampling of a relatively small number of files. To address these widespread abuses, the agencies initiated an enforcement action against all 14 banks. They directed a comprehensive review of all files of affected owners to identify borrowers that have been financially harmed and provide remediation. Professor Warren, when will we know the full extent of this problem this year and next year? Do you, do you know? 
Congressman, I do not. I, I rely on Sheila Baer in her most recent testimony, who pointed out, even with this, we really do not yet know the full extent of the problem. And it is pretty bad, huh? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, the Investors Business Daily uh, uh, reported on uh, July 8th that uh, the Justice Department is, uh, has an investigation ongoing uh, about bias banks, about uh, lending in minority communities. And I was wondering, in, it, you know, you have been an advisor to the Justice before under your testimony. Um, and uh, uh, regarding mortgage, the mortgage issue, the mortgage servicer issue. So uh, I was, wanted to know if you if you are serving as an advisor uh, uh, for this investigation. The, the Secretary of the Treasury asked us to get involved in the mortgage servicing issue. I am asking. You have already I, I testified was, about that. I, but I was wondering about this bias bank investigation that has been reported in the New York Times and the Investors Business Daily. Uh, he has not asked us to to be involved in that. I okay. don't, I Thank don't you. believe. Um, now, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, in my opinion, I th financial terms uh, need to be accurately and uh, correctly disclosed to individuals, and individuals can make uh, their, de their decisions based on whether or not they would like to purchase the product. For instance, the one-page mortgage disclosure uh, issue you mentioned in your testimony that you mentioned before uh, that I mentioned in my opening statement. I think that is positive. I think it gives individuals uh, the terms that they need, and it is very similar to the legislation that, uh, uh, that I put forward a couple of years ago. So, um, now, so disclosure, I think, is an important piece in, in all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, what you see for the CFPB, mm -hmm. yes, do you sir. think your actions mainly pertain to enhancing disclosures? Um, is that, do you think that is going to be the, the core work of the CFPB? Well, I, I, I think the best way to understand it is that there are multiple tools available in order to try to promote a functioning market. And there is no doubt that no market functions if people don't have meaningful and adequate disclosure. But I, I never want to back away from the part that a significant part of what we will do will be supervision and enforcement. More than half of our resources will go to supervision and enforcement over uh, financial institutions to make sure that there is a hop on the beat, making sure everyone is following the rules. Uh, and that includes both banks and non-banks. And if you will forgive me, I would also add to that, just because I think of this in terms of the, the central areas where we work, we also will have a significant responsibility on consumer financial uh, education. We are required by Dodd-Frank to do that, and so, sir, we will we'll be doing okay. that as well. Now, do you think in terms of financial products uh, now, mm -hmm. um, do, you think, do you see a financial product that is so complex that disclosure wouldn't be uh, a remedy? Yeah, it is a, it's a good and an interesting question, uh, Congressman McHenry. I recall sitting in the House Financial Services uh, during long testimony, and the question came up about banning products. And I remember that Ed Yingling, uh, the then president of the American Bankers Association, said, yes, there are certain products that should be banned. I am less certain if that is true. Um, I am a big believer in disclosure, meaningful disclosure. And I would at least like to start with the uh, concept of let's get out there and try some real disclosure, put some real power into the hands of consumers, and see if we can't get these markets working. I believe in markets. Do you, do you see a, a financial product out there today that needs to be eliminated? Uh, I, I don't know of one, sir. Okay. Uh, but if you had a particular suggestion you would like me to take a look at or well, others I, I don't, to take a look at. And there may be I others. I don't have a half billion dollar budget, so I would leave it to you and the 400 people working for you. Um, in in terms we, of, uh, that is why I thought you would have some ideas on this. Now, in terms of enforcement mechanisms uh, with CFPB, beyond disclosure, uh, do you think those enforcement mechanisms would prescribe terms uh, going forward, uh, meaning setting interest rates um, uh, and, and fee structures? No, I. Sir, I think what enforcement mechanisms are about are making sure that the laws 
are properly enforced. And it's done, as I understand it, both through supervision and through direct enforcement. That is, if, if it can't be worked out otherwise, suing banks if they don't follow the law or suing non-bank financial institutions if they don't follow the law. But wouldn't part of the remedy be that they change their practices going forward in a way that you describe? For instance, in the mortgage disclosure uh, issue that we're talking about, the mortgage settlement issue, uh, that is a significant piece of this, prescribing terms going forward. Yes, sir. That, that would be new regulations that would replace the older, complicated, more complex regulations that required higher regulatory costs for the financial institutions and probably produced a whole lot less value for consumers. And what we are going to do now, and I think what we have got, is something that is both cheaper for mortgage originators, for banks, particularly for community banks and credit unions, to issue and uh, produces more value for, for consumers. And it is a form. And they will be required to follow the form, just like, oops, I'm sorry, just like under current law, only it would be a, an easier and we think more effective form. Ms. Maloney is recognized for five minutes. I'm, uh, the, the minority presented the list, and I'm reading the list. Uh, if the gentlelady wants to. I thank you for considering me, but uh, I think it's based on arrival. Thank, thank you uh, uh, very much, and uh, welcome, Professor Warren. I, I, I um, would like to ask you that uh, after we went uh, through the Great Recession and almost uh, had the Great Depression in which $18 trillion in personal wealth in this country was lost, uh, would you say there was an overwhelming consensus that reforms were needed to prevent another crisis and that the CFPB and I would say the Credit Card Bill of Rights, which I authored, were and are important protections for consumers? Yes, ma'am, I would. And do and you think that the CFPB is already carefully constructed, urgently needed, and should be free to protect consumers as intended and go into effect on July 21st? Yes, ma'am, I do. Well, what has uh, concerned me deeply, uh, not only in this committee but in the Financial Services Committee in which I serve, is the number of questions uh, against you because people have asked you for advice. Now, I thought uh, freedom of speech was in our Constitution and a fundamental right of our country. Uh, you have been described as a leading consumer uh, specialist advisor. Is it unusual for, well, you are an advisor to the President now and to Secretary Greitner, but is it unusual for other members of, of government, uh, Congress members, AGs, states, city council members? other professors, um, other uh, leaders and captains of industry or, or, or managers in industry, is it unusual for them to call you and ask you for advice? Congresswoman, I have been giving advice for a very long time. I, I, uh, I hope it has been valuable, but I have always been willing to answer the phone and always been willing to talk to people. And, and uh, you, you can't uh, uh, you don't have a vote on anything right now. You are you're just basically putting in place an agency that the President has asked you to put this agency in place. So you basically don't have any power to force anyone to do anything. Yes, ma'am, that's right. But you can answer the phone and you can give advice. Well, I would say that is a, a basic American fundamental principle and one that should be protected uh, uh, for every person. Uh, uh, and especially uh, professors and, and academics that are leading specialists in areas. Uh, if you talk about oversight, you talk about transparency, the last thing we want to do is say people can't give advice. Would you say that is a, a fair statement? Well, I, I like to think that it is good to get advice. I, I should say, Congresswoman, I believe in advice and I believe in it in both directions. We have been the beneficiaries of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau of a great deal of advice from many, many people outside government and many people inside government, and I am glad we have been able to do that. Okay. I, I would like a unanimous consent to place in the, the record an, an article that was in the American Banker uh, entitled, A Leaderless CFPB is Not a Blessing 
for America's bankers. Without objection. And, and it talks about uh, banks will likely pay a price for a leadership CFPB. And it talks about what the CFPB on July, uh, what they can do in July 21st, but what they can't do if they don't have a confirmed leader. Now, what they can do is write and enforce the rules that are already in place uh, from the FTC and HUD and other banking agencies. But what is interesting to me is what they cannot do, which I believe would be very beneficial to placing American banking on a, le a level playing field. And they cannot de define which uh, nine banks should be supervised by the agency. They cannot examine or enforce laws against the non-banks. And we know it was the unregulated non-bank activities uh, with the subprime mortgages and with the, with the uh, credit default swaps, uh, uh, highly leveraged le uh, derivatives that led us to this crisis. Uh, so not allowing the leader to come in and do this, uh, according to the American banker, uh, would be harmful uh, to the financial institutions of our country. Uh, particularly the regulated banks. Could you elaborate on that, uh, Professor Warren? Well, Congresswoman, I will just say that um, I think that the, when a consumer agency has its director and has its powers ready to go, fully operational, uh, it will be a very good day. I, I, I would like to uh, also comment on, on uh, the ranking member's first statement. I have two, three seconds to go. Expired. I have four seconds. Oh, my time has expired. All right. Oh, thank my you. goodness. Uh, I just want to say 160 service members uh, were uh, foreclosed on unfairly, according to the Department of Justice, and I feel that his subpoena is rightly in order and should, on the merits, uh, we should look at this uh, information on the abuse to the American military servicemen and women. Uh, Mr. Chaffetz is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, House Appropriations Com Committee was quoted in their report as saying, quote, disappointed that an agency dedicated to transparency and accountability was not more forthcoming about how it plans to spend the taxpayer money. It also went on in there to say, quote, in the absence of this fine print, the committee cannot discern what the Consumer Finan Financial Protection Board plans to do, how it will do it, or how much it will cost. Given that your agency is about to open up here in about a week, how do the taxpayers, how do we see what you are going to do and how you are going to do it? Well, uh, Congressman, we started five months before the date that we are supposed to go live, building a website, trying to put as much information out there as possible okay, about now on, the, on the website, my time is so limited, I, my apologies. Sorry. What I want to get is very specific about the, the budget that you put forward. In this document, which is just seven pages, it has just ten line items. The two biggest line items are full-time permanent positions followed by personnel benefits. That, that accounts for about $225 million in expenses. Third item is contractual services, which has a very specific number of $48,907,000. Where is the detail about what you are going to do and how you are going to do it? So how do we find the breakdown of that number and how you are going to organize this agency? Because you have obviously got some specificity in the numbers. We are looking for the documents, the transparency, and how you are actually going to do that. So, uh, Congressman, let me, let me try this at two levels, and you tell me if this is helpful. And if it is not, I will try please. a different way. The first level is to describe, in a big sense, where we will be spending money in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And if you just think of it like a pie. Half no, I am worried about the fine print, the details. The Appropriations okay. Committee, the, 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 this Oversight Committee, we don't have the details of how you are actually going to organize and put this, thing, put this forward. Okay. Let me read, for instance, uh, go ahead, go ahead. So also, Congressman, uh, the, and I am afraid I am blocking on the name, but every contract issued by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is done, as you would know, through the ordinary competitive process, when appropriate, through procurement. But in, but advance, but in, but in advance of those uh, 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 contracts, for instance, this is directly from the House Appropriations Committee. Unlike other agencies, the Consumer Financial Protection Board does not describe or explain the relationship between its policy objectives and the budgetary resources. Performance measures or goals, significant proposals that affect obligations in the 5 to 10 year period and their relationship to the current year and budget year, or the budgetary effect of workload, strategic planning, capital planning, or investment in an information technology. How do we get the details of all of this information? You obviously have a top-line number, and that was based on something, but you seem to be hiding the details of 
how you came up with those numbers. Congressman, no one is hiding anything. We publish all contracts in, it is not called the Federal Register, there is a special place these are published. But I am not I talking about also, the contracts. You have only on your website for consumer. I am worried about the person who is out you know, in Albuquerque or in Provo, Utah. How do they find out the makeup of all these numbers and the details? As the Appropriations Committee suggested, they can't see that information. I doubt the public can see it either. Then they may want to go to www.usaspending.gov. It will list the type of contract the awardee and the amount of the contract. They may also want what to What about all these other items, for instance, not just the contracts, performance measures and goals, budgetary resources, how you are going to, what are these people going to be, where do we find all that information? Because it is not on the website compared to other agencies. Uh, Congressman, we are in the process, for example, of developing our performance metrics. And we are not yet standing up as an agency, but as soon as we are stood up, we are putting as much of this as possible. So are you saying by next week you are going to have this? Let, let me say it this way, Congressman. You, you just said you would have it when you stand we, up, and that is next week. So are you telling me that this will be available next week? Congressman, I don't want to overpromise because I am not sure how many things you read. I am not familiar with the document you are reading from. You are not, you're not familiar with the appropriations uh, I, I report? Don't, I, of course, I try to stay up with the appropriations right. work. I'm just trying. I'm not sure what particular paragraphs and lines. You're going to hand that to you right here. It's, it's the, the budget justification, which is dramatically different than any other agency moving forward. I, I'm sorry, Congressman. Is this your document? This is our document. Yes. I, I think you were reading from something else, sir. But based on your giving that document to the appropriations committee, the appropriations committee said. Unlike other agencies, and it listed out all the other things that they are expect that they normally see that we normally see as members of the oversight committee, and all of that is absent. Congressman, we point of information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could we get a copy of this document to also look at it so we could understand the questioning? Sure, sure. Yeah, we'll get one. And could I also ask: Is there a request outstanding from the Appropriations Committee that? That, that's more, my understanding. Yes. Yes, and I think this committee is also asking for that for that same sort of transparency. Congressman, if that's the case, we would be glad to come back. We would be glad to brief you. We would be glad to work with you in order to find something that is adequately transparent, both to Congress and to the American people. I have Gentlemen, to yield back. My time has expired, but I would hope that that information be on the website for the public as well. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Mr. Tierney for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is stunning. I really have to say this whole display of uh, being concerned about a consumer group, that somebody might actually be standing up uh, for to protect the consumer and the taxpayer here as opposed to flacking for the banks. Uh, this is a not too transparent attempt here to sabotage will the consumer protection yield for, agency. Will the gentleman yield for no, 15 I won't, seconds? Sir. I won't. I only have five minutes, all right, and I probably won't get to go over as you did. Right. But the fact of the matter is this is absolutely incredible. We have no concern here about responding to subpoenas to the banks, asking them to show us documents related to their foreclosure on servicemen and women acting in Afghanistan and Iraq on behalf of the American the people. The gentleman yield. But we are you know, going around and around and around here well, the about an agency that is in the process of standing up. Uh, Professor Warren, you know, I think you know, the, the abysmal record of these mortgage services is pretty well chronicled. I have over 100 cases at any given time in my office alone. You know, they lose documents, they are unresponsive, they give conflicting guidance, they refuse to process payments, uh, they have false negative credit reporting. All of that is going on, and it is terrible for the people generally, but it is even more terrible when they do it with respect to our service members who are deployed overseas. Uh, so I want to ask you about a particular case, a case of Captain Kenneth uh, Gonzalez in the United States Army. Would you put that up, please? Uh, I think you may be familiar with this case, and I want to ask you about it. He was deployed to Iraq as a lieutenant from December of 2009 to December of 2010. His bank, Chase, told Captain Gonzalez's wife to submit their mortgage payments by using money orders. So she did it. But Chase then failed to process the payments. Then they submitted inaccurate negative reports to the credit bureaus, which then affected and badly impacted Captain Gonzalez's security clearance while he was still deployed. The military JAG officer tried to help him. But she described the uphill battle that she had when she wrote an email to the American Bar Association. I would like to quote it for you. She said, to be honest, I have not been able to do anything for this client. I am just talking to clerks at the customer service section who refuse to talk to me without a letter of authorization, which I have sent in four separate times to four separate fax numbers. 
I am given a different one every time and told processing takes 48 to 72 hours. I have left voice messages with two supervisors and no one calls me back. Basically, I just need to talk with a human being that will listen to the facts of this case and who will understand the need to make it right. Professor Warren, if this JAG officer can't get any reaction you know, from a mortgage servicer, how do we expect that our members in the service who are overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan are going to get uh, some response? I, I think you have put your finger on the problem, Congressman. Uh, these systems are not designed to be responsive. Well, you know, Chase had clear errors and clear abusive practices. They then tried to charge Mr. Uh, Captain Gonzalez fees, fees, when they finally admitted they were wrong on the whole process and tried to help him unwind all the damage that had been done to him. So how often are mortgage services initiating these types of unlawful foreclosures and fee collections or whatever, uh, and then taking charge more fees at the back end? How often does that go on? Congressman, we do not know. There have not been full investigations of this, and there, there is no public information on this. Well, as I said at the outset, you know, this is far from unique in a situation. Uh, we, I think everybody on both sides of this dais have had these kinds of complaints coming in from their constituents, some, no doubt, from people that are in the service, and that is why it is critical that we get the documents the ranking member has subpoenaed and asked this committee to subpoena, and that we go through and we thoroughly investigate all these illegalities and these abuses. No service member. No service member should spend his or her personal time while they are in Iraq or Afghanistan trying to unwind customer service mistakes from a bank that just isn't doing the job they should do, nor should their family be evicted from their home and foreclosed upon. Thank you. I yield back. I yield to Ms. General Maloney, if she likes. Uh, there, there have been a number of, of uh, settlements. I, I want to applaud the gentleman's work on this. But there were a number of settlements with uh, countrywide, uh, particularly with service members, where they were fined, I believe, well over $20 million for foreclosing and throwing the service members' families out on the street while they were serving in Iraq. I have read those documents, and I ask uh, permission to put them in the record to support the fine work of Mr. Tierney and also to say that uh, we can talk about substance, process, appropriations, but we are the investigative committee. And I believe that we should follow uh, on with a subpoena or with voluntary actions uh, the leadership that the ranking members put forward to look at the bottom of this. Uh, recently, Holly Petraeus, who is heading up a, a very special division uh, for the military, testified in the Senate and also uh, 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 on the very extreme problems. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burkle is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Warren, for being here today. Uh, we had the opportunity to question you in a subcommittee hearing where we called attention to the salaries of many that will be working in your, uh, in your new department and the concern that those salaries were anywhere from 10 to 40 percent higher than Federal salaries and that the salaries you set for your employees are not subject to and not uh, consistent with the, the Federal salaries and that you have the autonomy to set your own salaries. And the concern that in this economy that may be as uh, a little more liberty than we would like with the American taxpayers' dollars. But I, I just want to talk a couple of uh, issues here. First of all, we heard about the service men and women and the particular issue with Chase Bank. That issue was already declared illegal. I mean, so I am trying to understand, we all agree, and this body, and this is a bipartisan issue, that our men and women should be protected and no home should be foreclosed on when they are overseas serving this nation. But, but this action by Chase was already deemed illegal. We heard that countywide has already had a settlement. How do we justify this $500 million department if that is if that's the gist of what we are talking about here? Congresswoman, I, I would put it this way. We know about specific abuses that have come to light. They were brought to light by the press, not by government investigation. And we know of three specific mortgage servicers who have publicly admitted to wrongdoing and engaged in a, a, a voluntary settlement. And, um, and was, excuse me, and again, we have such a short period of time. I'm sorry. It, I, and again, yes, was that, that wasn't your department. You're not up and running yet. 
that, no, that shed light on those abuses to the military? That is right. Okay. But the question I, I thought you asked is how the consumer agency may be helpful. We are there to be an ongoing monitor. We have only talked with three mortgage servicers here so far. Let me put it this way. We set up our Office of Military of Service Member Affairs back in January. It was one of the first groups we organized. Shortly after that, press reports came out about illegal foreclosures against service members. Just to give you an idea of what we do, Holly Petraeus wrote a letter immediately to 25 servicers asking them to review their practices. And we have heard back from about half of those servicers and engaged in some discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I don't wish to, to cut you off, but I know in Veteran Affairs we have handled this issue up front close. And, and so. Yes, ma'am. Um, I do want to talk to you about a couple of issues. Number one, this past week the jobs numbers came out and they were horrific. Uh, as you know, the only 18,000 jobs in, were added in June. My concern is what you are going to do will continue to hurt job growth in this country. So I would like to know from you specifically, do you intend to raise compliance costs or raise the cost of, of credit for consumers? So, Congresswoman, I should say we are trying to make prices clear risks clear, and we are trying to make it easy for families to compare products. I don't think that that is going to cost people jobs. I think it likely makes them a little more secure. In the case specifically of compliance costs, our first initiative is the one that uh, uh, Congressman McHenry also talked about. Congress and the regulatory agencies have been working for 15 years. Well, to excuse, try excuse me. I, again, our time, I watch my time clicking away. Do you intend to raise compliance costs on companies, which will further add to the unemployment and the difficulties that our companies and, and small business owners are, are facing in this economy? Congresswoman, I am sorry. That is a I yes was, or a no. It, it is a no. We already have our first example of what we are doing, lowers compliance costs. That is why it has been embraced by the American Bankers Association by the Independent Community Bankers Association, by the Consumer Bankers Association, by the credit unions. It has been embraced by bankers and mortgage originators across the country. So that is a no. You're not, you do not intend to raise compliance costs no, for companies we're, or for businesses? We're trying to, okay. Sorry. We are trying to lower costs for them. Never, ever? <laughs> well, right now what we are trying to do, we have lined up what we are trying to do, and we hope it is the prototype for all of our work. We are working closely with community banks. We are working closely with credit unions. Thank you. One last question. You talked in your testimony about, and it concerns me, that you have this conception that the mortgage and the uh, credit consumer world is fraught with trips and tra uh, tr tricks and traps. I think that was your word. If that is the case, and you are sitting here saying that this world is fraught with all of these issues, and this goes back to the Chairman's question, what, what is it that you intend to ban? What is it that you intend to change? If you are saying this world is filled with trips and traps, what is it that you intend to, to, uh, to change and to, to Congresswoman, I don't think banning is the right way. This is what we are talking about. It is make the prices clear, make the risks clear, mow down the fine prints so it is possible for consumers to compare one product to two or three others. But then why do you need the power in a $500 million dollar budget? That is my concern. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. The witness may have answers. I am sorry? The witness may answer oh, the question. You. I just didn't hear you. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, we need a budget because these are very large and powerful financial institutions who hire armies of lawyers to design financial products that can't be read by ordinary American families. We need some pushback. We are the voice on behalf of the customer, of the American family. Ms. Norton is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Professor Warren and, and to indicate that I have asked staff to look and they, they inform me that the salaries, the salaries are in line with all banking regulatory agencies. I want to go back to this report and to the bicameral forum um, and to some of what was said at that forum, because this committee should be trying to, dis to find out whether what <clears throat> we found from law enforcement amounts to a systematic problem that needs further investigation. 
Holly Petraeus, uh, the head of the Office of Service Member Affairs, appeared at this bicameral forum. And she was asked whether the cases of the kind she had heard uh, were isolated or more typical. And let, let me read you what she, she said. Uh, she recalled a National Guard wife saying to me that every time her husband was activated, and he had been activated three times, she had to go through an extended fight with her bank to get the interest rate reduction. And it was the same thought of, of things, send the paperwork, oh, we don't have the record on that, send it again, send it again, send it again. Uh, have you heard a similar accounts? Yes, ma'am, I have. Um, the, uh, I, I want to ask you about what um, uh, you think uh, that CFPB could do, because we know it's not charged with enforcing the Service uh, uh, Act. So, uh, so I think it's fair to ask what would be the role of the CFPB uh, in uncovering and doing something about these kinds of abuses and ensuring that what our service members are encountering uh, does not happen again and again with bank after bank. Thank you. If, if I can, I will give a two-part answer. The first part is that last week uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, led by Holly Petraeus, signed uh, an understanding with the Judge Advocates General of all of the services. And uh, it was for how we can cooperate and, between the two of us, uh, use our resources more effectively to protect service members. We had already been well into the process of working with the Department of Defense, and uh, uh, this was just a more formal acknowledgment of that process, and I think building a strong relationship going forward. But I also want to say a second thing about it within the consumer agency, and that is what it means to have a strong leader like Holly Petraeus, what it means to make an Office of Service Member Affairs front and central in this organization. And that is, we have started reaching out. Uh, Holly Petraeus and I went together to a uh, joint base uh, in San Antonio. Uh, uh, we have been to other places. She has been on her own. She has opened up a website. We have hired more people. Well, Professor so, Warren, I, this is just the kind of, of thing we had hoped uh, you would be doing. Uh, I would like to ask you, though, about the kinds of, of complaints uh, that you expect to receive first when you come online uh, on July 21st. Uh, what com have you anticipated uh, what kind of complaints are likely to come to the forefront? And, uh, have the, uh, do you expect these service member complaints to be among them? We have reason to believe, because we have already been reaching out to service members and service member families and actually are already in active communication with many families and with many of those who serve service member families, we anticipate that this will be a significant part over time of our workload at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Uh, is there any recent update on uh, the disposition of the subpoena motion that was going to be addressed at uh, 10, 1040? Well, the Chair announced that it would not happen before 1040. There is no update. So uh, midnight might be a good time. Is that the idea? Or can we have a little closer approximation? Some members have other business to attend to as well. And in fairness to the members on both sides, it would be nice to have some idea of roughly when you think that might occur. The Chair will give a 30-minute notice, uh, which was uh, the ranking member's request. And uh, the Chair will, has, will now announce that you will have a 30-minute uh, heads up before the vote happens. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Dr. Desjardins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Warren, thank you for being here today. I have a, a pretty simple question. Uh, I uh, am, represent Tennessee and also sit on the Agricultural Committee. And, uh, I was just curious to know uh, your take on a, an issue central to ensuring credit for Tennesseans and uh, uh, farmers in general. Uh, Title X in the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, the act which creates your agency, the CFPB, states that the Farm Credit Administration will retain all of its enforcement authorities over persons regulated by the 
Farm Credit Administration, and that the CFPB will have no authority to exercise any enforcement powers under the Dodd-Frank Act with respect to persons regulated by the FCA. So um, is it your interpretation that the CFPB has any enforcement authority uh, over institutions regulated by the FCA? Dr. Desjardins, this is evidently a question that is uh, what lawyers are all about. Uh, it, the language you read, as I have been briefed on this, I think you used the word persons. And then there is a question about whether that covers institutions, entities, covered entities which are different from persons in this. And so, as I understand it, the lawyers are out trying to just trying to work this through to make sure there aren't any gaps and there aren't any overlaps. That, that's my understanding at this point, sir. Okay. I'm not sure that I fully understood your answer. Uh, so is it your interpretation that the CFPB has any enforcement authority over institutions regulated well, by the FCA? So, Congressman, I'm, I'm just going to have to back up. The statutory language you used referred to persons and your question referred to institutions. And what the lawyers are trying to figure out from multiple uh, authorities here, how is it that we get appropriate coverage, which is what we all want, mm -hmm. and, not, and, and to carry out Congress's will? So all I'm saying, sir, is I, I think there's a little bit of a, a statutory interpretation question, in the, and we're just trying to work through it in a, in a reasonable way. We just want to make sure we carry out the intent of Congress. Okay. So what do I tell my farmers? Well, you tell your farmers that because of the language in this particular part of the statute, the lawyers are working on it right now. Well, I don't know if that would be very comforting to them. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I certainly understand that, sir. <laughs> I, do, I do have a second question. Sure. Um, and it, as you know, nearly half of small uh, businesses use personal credit cards when they are uh, first founded. Uh, can you commit that none of CFPB's regulations will remove financing? financing possibilities for these businesses? Oh, Congressman, you, you hit on a very important question. Uh, as you rightly know, um, uh, it is consumer credit that we do at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And as you also know, because I have said it probably every chance I get, uh, that we are about trying to make prices clear and risks clear and trying to mow down fine print so people can make real comparisons. I have actually had small business groups reach out to me and small business individuals who would like to know that they are going to have coverage and that they will have the same kind of protection about clarity in pricing and clarity in risks and not face fine print if they are using a credit card to try to start a small business. And I, I think this is going to be a real challenge because we have a constrained authority at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, sir. Okay, so it is going to be a struggle, you are saying, to determine whether credit is being used for personal use or business use? Well, what, what I am saying is the way Dodd-Frank was established, it is clear that we can help beat down the fine print in the case of consumer credit cards. But in the case of business credit cards, our, our authority is limited. Okay. Uh, would there be a situation where there is a credit card that has a 20 percent interest rate and you step in and say, no, you can't uh, have that? Congressman, the, the statute is quite clear that we are not in the business of establishing usury laws. Congress spoke unambiguously. We, I know there are some parts of the statute that are ambiguous, but I think that part is pretty unambiguous, sir, pretty clear. Okay. So small businesses can uh, breathe comfortably that they are going to have access to credit? Yeah. I, I want to say it this way. Small businesses are struggling. I understand that. And access to credit is about a whole lot of issues. But in terms of what we are doing here at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we are hoping we are going to make things a little better for all those good people out there who are trying to start businesses and that it will be good for them if they know prices, if they know risks, if there is not so much fine print in their contracts. Thank you, Professor Warren. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Clay, for five Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Professor Warren, for being here. And before I go into the question, let me state that this is one of the most incredible committee hearings that I have ever attended in this committee uh, because the two sides are so far apart. Um, I, I, I just can't help but give you two examples of abuses uh, 
that, that, that cry for an agency like this Bureau. One uh, is, is the, uh, the area that I represent in North St. Louis County, uh, where homeowners, middle class African American homeowners, were steered into high cost predatory loans. And if you look at a map of the foreclosures in my community, it is evident that they were steered and that, the, and that these predators took advantage of them. And the second example, and, and, and let me say, you know, uh, to my colleagues, uh, patriotism also means standing up for the men and women who wear our uniform, who bravely, who bravely defend this country. Uh, and if you don't think this is an abuse, uh, then I have a bridge to sell you. You know, illegal foreclosures against U.S. service members is a growing problem. Multiple mortgage servicing companies have conceded that they violated service members' Civil Relief Act. They illegally foreclosed on service members and charged fees in excess of the maximum amounts allowed under the law. And we have only begun to understand the scope of these problems. In April, four Federal agencies that regulate market services issued a report finding critical weaknesses. They initiated enforcement actions against 14 banks, and they directed a comprehensive review to identify borrowers who have been financially harmed and to provide remediation. And it is good that these agencies are on the job. But this highlights just one of the many reasons why we need the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, and abusive financial practices. Uh, and if we and nobody, if people here don't understand that, then I don't know what what we can do about that. But it, it's good that the agencies work to enforce the law after the fact. But consumers, and especially active duty service members shouldn't have to go through an illegal foreclosure in the first place. Think about it. A service member stationed overseas, fighting for their country, risking their life, while back here their family is losing their home illegally. That is devastating and no one should have to endure that. Uh, Professor Warren, I understand that you organized an office of Service Member Affairs with CFPB. Can you please explain the role of the CFPB in protecting the rights of service members and their families? Yes, sir. Um, when we set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, one of the first pieces that we tried to put in place and make active was the Office of Service Member Affairs. I first met with Holly Petraeus I, I believe it was October, although my, my calendar is public, so it would be possible to find that. And she had come to see me about what she thought were terrible abuses that were going on with military families. And she said to me, you now have this new consumer agency and you can do something about this. Um, I must say, for a small woman, she is very forceful. And uh, uh, I listened to her and took lots of notes, and she had lots of very specific instances of what she was concerned about and very specific recommendations for what we could do. So uh, about a week went by, and I invited her to come back. And uh, we talked a second time, and she had even more ideas. And that is when I realized we had found our leader for the Office of Service Member Affairs. And uh, I made her a, an offer. Uh, and she came to work for us. And that is really how I want to describe this. This office started with someone who fully on the ground understands what is happening to military families. She herself comes from a military family from generations of, of military of service people, um, and she has seen it firsthand. She often describes that she has even lived parts of this. She was there from the beginning to build an Office of Service Member Affairs that said we at this agency will be responsible for identifying what is going wrong, for dealing with service members, families who get caught 
in traps and for helping change, putting a cop on the beat to make sure that those who are dealing with military service members are following the law. That is our job. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pastor South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Free of legislative micromanaging, the Financial Product Safety Commission could develop nuanced regulatory responses. Some terms might be banned altogether, while others might be permitted only with clear disclosure. So you don't support legislative micromanaging. What about legislative macromanaging? I am sorry, Congressman. I'm, I don't it is a quote a from an article you wrote, free of legislative micromanaging. So my question to you is, what is legislative micromanaging? Because to me it is a euphemism for oversight. I am sorry, Congressman. I, I may have written it, but I am not sure what the context is. What the, was it an article? Uh, it is, it, it, the context is it is in the Democracy Journal. All right. And it is uh, the first public notion that we have of an agency similar to the one that you are going to head in a week. And you wrote an article about? Yes. And you said, free of legislative micromanaging, the Financial Product Safety Commission could develop nuanced regulatory responses. Some terms might be banned. My question to you is, um, to some of us, legislative micromanaging is a euphemism for oversight. Actually, I think this goes to the point that Congressman McHenry raised, and that was the question, you may recall, uh, we are trying to figure out how to combine the TILA and RESPA forms, complicated, hard to read, high regulatory compliance cost for the bank, or at least higher, uh, very little value for the consumers. Uh, for more than 15 years, the various regulatory agencies have been negotiating to try to bring those together. And as Congressman McHenry said, there have been multiple attempts from Congress trying to do it. The Ms. Warren, problem, my, 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 I, question, my, my question is actually more general than that. My question is, what is the role for congressional oversight? You don't like legislative micromanaging. You wrote that. No. Uh, some of us think that that is oversight. So do you concede that Congress um, has the authority and should have the authority to, for instance, hypothetically set the budget for your agency? Is that legislative micromanaging or is that oversight? Congressman, I was trying to respond to your question, and what I was trying to point out is that it was an example of how difficult it is for Congress to get an appropriate, nuanced response uh, to a specific problem. And in this case, it was combining two forms that what we have been able to do at the consumer agency, because agencies operate differently, is that we have had banks in, community banks, credit unions. We have been able to put out multiple iterations of the forms. We have been able to adjust. We have been able to consult with groups in ways that is not possible in the legislative well, process. Would the gentleman Warren, yield for yes. a moment? Yes. I, I think, Mr. Gowdy, is very happy you doing what you are doing. I, I think what he is really asking is, does Congress have a right to look over your shoulder, and did that statement indicate that you think that not, Congress not sec looking over your shoulder, second-guessing your, your funding or, in fact, your actions? That is, I think, the question, and I haven't heard an answer. I am sorry, Congressman. Let me give as straightforward an answer as I could. My direct testimony this morning is, of course, we need to be responsible to the Congress the Congress should look over our shoulder 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I was trying to explain what, once I understood where the passage came from, I was just trying to explain what I thought that passage meant. But well, may the record reflect that your, your article did not go into the detail that your answer this morning went into on that nuanced point. And so I will I'll ask a less nuanced question. Yes, sir. What about congressional involvement in your budget? Is that micromanaging or is that uh, oversight? Congressman, I think it is neither. I think that is a big policy and political decision. As you know, sir, not one banking regulator in the history of the United States has ever had its funding through the political process. So you agree that Congress should not be responsible for setting the budget for your agency? I believe that Congress should treat all of the banking regulators alike and not say that the one that tries to watch out for consumers 
is going to be put through the political process and subject to lobbying by trillion-dollar financial you, you did mention oversight in your opening statement, and the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, uh, for whom I have great regard, uh, used the term illegal seven times. It has been used an additional five times since Mr. Cummings used it. Criminal and civil engagement with companies is also another form of oversight. If these practices are illegal, then why isn't Eric Holder sitting here with you explaining what he's done? Why do we need your agency if they are already illegal? Well, Congressman, I think there is a real question about whether there has been adequate investigation into what financial What institutions have you done with respect to Attorney General Holder and the 90-plus United States attorneys, most of whom have been appointed by this administration? What have you done to cajole them to do their jobs? Because I have heard the word illegal, and that has a very specific meaning to me. If it is illegal, what have you done to cajole the prosecutors to do something about it? Uh, Congressman, that is what we did when we got involved in mortgage settlement and were so sharply criticized for having advised the Department of Justice and our sister agencies as they are trying to work through holding responsible the parties you who have violated the law. You were criticized for referring people for criminal prosecution? Uh, Congressman, we were criticized for trying to By help. By whom? Uh, Not me. Congressman McHenry. It, well, uh, Congress, I'm, I'm going to let Congressman, I, I, I I'm gonna let Congressman McHenry speak for himself. But as a former prosecutor, when I hear the term illegal, which I have heard 12 times this morning, I want to know why there aren't criminal prosecutions, why we need an agency and the Department of Justice can't do it. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a question for the witness. I do have a comment, and primarily aimed at the junior members of the committee on both sides of the aisle. I think all of us realize that this Congress is viewed as dysfunctional, and I would submit that this committee is also viewed as dysfunctional. And this alleged hearing is one of the reasons why. It too easily degenerates into a partisan food fight, and it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, just a few years ago in Congress, it was not this way. So I would urge the junior members of the committee to resist the partisan talking points that enable people on both sides of the aisle to walk in here, read a question, make a partisan hit, look like we are smart, and then leave. That is not good governance, regardless of which party is in charge. I didn't vote for Dodd-Frank. It had many good features. It had some less good features. But I do not want to be part of a committee, at least at the subcommittee level, treated Ms. Warren with more rudeness and disrespect than I have ever seen a committee witness treated. That is not the American way. Now, some of us come here and we get so used to the food fight that we want it to continue. And you will probably score brownie points if you make your partisan hit. You might even get on a better committee. Well, congratulations. You will not have solved a problem. I would suggest to the chairman and the ranking member that oftentimes a seminar format is much more instructive, is much more educational than the sort of partisan charade we seem to continue to engage in you know, with hearings like this. I would urge members to read Ms. Warren's one of her books. I have only read The Two Income Trap. It is outstanding. Your constituents back home should read this book. Your bankers back home should read this book. Then there would be a lot less hatred, a lot less discord, a lot less anger, because this lady is trying to do the right thing. And we all recognize that consumers oftentimes get the short end of the stick. I have tried to refinance my home mortgage several times to take advantage of today's record low interest rates, and the paperwork is a blizzard. I went to a very good law school, and it is almost impossible for lawyers to understand this stuff. Ms. Warren has pointed out that the existing regulatory agencies have taken over a decade to try to simplify a couple of the forms, and they have failed. 
What has this committee done to simplify some of the forms? Nothing. So isn't it time for a new approach? Isn't it time for fresh thinking to give the consumers a break? And let us also acknowledge that Congress is sometimes captured by the vested interests. Sometimes that happens, and we need to resist that. So I would urge the members of the committee, particularly the junior members who are not so entrenched in bad habits, to consider new and fresher approaches to solve some of these problems so that we can protect consumers and also give legitimate industries a fair shake, because all bankers aren't bad people. But I am afraid that we are falling into a rut here that is going to be to the detriment not only of this committee and this Congress, but of the Nation. It doesn't have to be this way. We can be civil to each other. We can be informed. We can resist the partisan talking points. But I am not seeing that sort of behavior, at least so far. So let's try to do better, and let's try to be civil to witnesses like Ms. Warren. Let's try to focus on the substance, because I have actually heard very little substance here today. And there are better ways to solve our problems. And I hope that this committee will be part of those. So I thank the chairman. I see that my time has about expired. Would, would the gentleman yield? I would be delighted. Uh, we have worked together for a long time, and, and I join with you in wanting this hearing and any talking points in front of any member, junior or senior, to be about our oversight. I do uh, agree with you on the simplification. Patrick McHenry offered a bill like that a number of years ago uh, and continues to support it. I hope that all of us understand that our jurisdiction here is limited. We are here to discuss the, whether Dodd-Frank got it right for the organization, whether uh, Professor Warren is now finding things which are poorly defined within the statute that she is working and her 400 employees are working to try to resolve, whether some committee, probably financial services primarily, needs to revisit to give her guidelines, additional authority, and so on. If we do our job right, and the gentleman is absolutely right, we will, in fact, be talking about an organization that Professor Warren may head as the first head. She may not, but she is certainly the most knowledgeable witness. And I have said this hearing will be about civil behavior for uh, Professor Warren and about a dialogue about the agency that she has put a year of her life into standing up. So I join with the gentleman in full agreement. Well, Mr. Chairman, a civil discussion would be a market improvement over the subcommittee's behavior. You are right that the Financial Services Committee does have substantive jurisdiction, but here we have had two hearings with Ms. Warren before her agencies even stood up. A lot of people are rushing to conclusions here, and sometimes that is the only exercise they get. Um, it is unfortunate that this Jim, nice it's lady one of the things we really do well here, isn't it, is, is make conclusions. has been treated as a partisan punching bag before she's even had a chance to really serve. So let us give all American citizens the benefit of the doubt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Warren, thanks for being here today. I'm over here. Uh, in my previous life, I was in the automobile business, and, and I know how critical it is. Sorry, I said in my previous life, I was in the automobile business, and the availability of credit is so, so critical. And I know that, and I have looked at your, your background. You really have an impressive background, and, and you have advised so many people on so many things. The availability of credit is one of those things. And I know that automobile loans come up quite often, and sometimes they are regarded as, as predatory and everything else. I mean, how would your agency work towards that end? Because we already are governed by the FTC. So is there going to be some overlap there? How is that going to work? And how are we going to be able to sift through that? So uh, we will start. I just want to make sure I am being responsive. And you, sure. you help me if I am not in the right place. On automobile loans in particular, you do know that dealer-initiated automobile loans, uh, that automobile dealers are not within the jurisdiction of the consumer agency, that Congress made that distinction in, in Dodd-Frank. And so the, the place where we are focused, and I just, I just want to be clear about this, it is really about saying consumers just need to, know what, they need to know what the price is. They need to kind of know generally what the risk is, the difference between, say, a fixed-rate mortgage and a variable-rate mortgage. Sure. And they need there to be 
less fine print, so they really have a shot at comparing straight up three mortgages, three credit card agreements, three checking accounts, so they can actually look at those. That is really the thrust of what we want to do. My own view of that is that that actually it makes credit, if anything, more available to consumers. Consumers can trust that when they sign on the bottom line, I get it. I know what is happening here. And, and that is true. And I think that oftentimes when, when we are dealing with retail customers and they go to a lender and we try to guide them through that process, and it can be very difficult, and I think well, there is a lot of good advice, and over the years you have given a lot of good advice to people. And, and one of the things that we always caution people about is you know, the amount of money that you are borrowing, the length of time that you are going to have it, and the, the amount of, of, sure. of the percentage that you are going to pay on it. And those are all critical aspects of it. I think we would both agree on that. Good. And, and, I, and, I, and I, so I guess what I am coming to you for, and, and I want to hear from you, because this is critical. This is critical. I am looking at uh, the American taxpayer is actually a cosigner to loans that are being asked for right now by a body that governs these folks, elected by them, governs them, borrows money on their behalf, and they actually sign up as the cosigner, the co-borrower. And, and I guess I am I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued. Uh, the the uh, emphasis is on credit availability, how much money you can borrow, and, and, and rightfully so, the banks actually put a, a limit on what you can borrow, a ceiling, as it were. And we are looking now at increasing a debt ceiling again. And I find that kind of amusing that we use the word ceiling, because in my, my world, a ceiling means it is something that is actually established and you can't go beyond. And all the lending institutions I have ever gone to, they put a ceiling on what you, go, what you can borrow and what you can't go beyond. And so now we are involved in this major and we are going to tell these co-signers who are responsible for making all the payments on these loans that, don't worry about that ceiling, that didn't really matter. We are going to continue to raise it because we have been so reckless and so irresponsible. And you know what? You put us here and you have put us in a position to actually borrow money for you that you are co-signing on. So as your, your past history and the way you have advised people, and I know right now the consumer is the most important part of where we are talking about. And we want to protect these people, because I, I noticed in your testimony you did say, an economy being driven to the brink of collapse. Mm -hmm. And we use terms about companies that are, or that are predatory companies and what we are doing to the economy. I think that maybe we should be expanding your role to taking a look at what this body is doing to not only the future and the, the, our children, our grandchildren, but to also the present. And I would like to, you know, you have great experience in this. This amount of money that we pay as interest is kind of artificially low right now. And if we think this debt limit now or this, this deficit is great now, wait till we get the real interest rates out there. Then people are, instead of holding their heads, they are really going to be holding their stomachs because they will be sick. So you know, I know you only have a couple seconds left, but how would you advise these consumers on buying in the product that they are being asked right now? to buy into and co-sign for? Well, Congressman, the, I think the one distinction I would make is I am very familiar with creditors putting limits on how much you can spend in the future. Uh, that is a, that's a world I live in. Uh, but I do want to say um, people expect you to meet your obligations that you have already incurred, yeah. and they expect you to meet those 100 cents on the uh, dollar. That is why in the automobile industry you actually have a beacon score that tracks your past history and it watches actually what your revenues are. That is a big part of what you are allowed to borrow. So I think that is maybe yeah. part of the equation we are looking beyond. Thank you, though, for your time. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmuth. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Warren, it is great to see you here again. And I had the opportunity during the subcommittee hearing some weeks ago to ask many of the questions I would ask, so I am not going to repeat them. Uh, one of the things that I was curious about is in the Republican budget that passed the House, uh, the so-called Ryan plan for Medicare uh, was part of that. And under that plan, for those people under 55 years old, uh, Medicare would no longer exist. Instead, citizens who then reached 65 would be given uh, some kind of payment in some form to go out and shop for insurance in the private insurance market. Uh, 
would you envision that that might be a role at some point for CFPB, that uh, insurance contracts would be subjected to the same uh, scrutiny in terms of clarity and, and uh, transparency that financi other financial documents would be? Congressman, I, I would say I think there are some very real concerns about the difficulty that consumers have reading insurance contracts and that it raises some of the very same issues we will be dealing with in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau over other kinds of contracts that are unreadable. But right now, Congress has put a very clear curb in place. We, we have a lane we are supposed to swim in. I think I just mixed my metaphors there. Uh, about consumer credit, consumer credit products, the issuing of consumer credit, credit reporting, and we are not to stray into insurance, and we are not to stray into investment products. And for right now, sir, that's, that's exactly what we will be doing. Certainly, I would think, though, that whatever progress you made in, in making sure that financial documents were understandable and transparent uh, might serve as a good model for other areas of the economy. I, I certainly hope that is the case. And I also want to say, and it is a little piece of the consumer agency since we are here doing oversight and you give me a chance to talk about the agency and, and, and the things it is going to do. We have a research division in our agency. In fact, it is called Research Markets and Rule Writing. We combine it all together. And we are building a robust research team, I mean, smart and very diversified in terms of approaches to how to think about research. And a significant part of what we will do will be look at what it takes to take complicated ideas and get them into something that really works on the ground day in and day out for American families. That research will be available to everyone, and I hope it will be useful in places beyond its implications in consumer credit. I am sure it will be. And in the remainder of my time, I, I had the privilege the other day of sitting in on a forum uh, that uh, Senator Rockefeller conducted with Holly Petraeus and a couple of the servicemen who had been subject to these incredibly uh, unscrupulous practices. And one of them was uh, Chief Warrant Officer Charles Pickett. And he was an Apache helicopter pilot serving in the, in the Army National Guard, was flying missions in Operation Iraqi freedom. And while he was on duty, Bank of America attempted to foreclose on his home. Actually, they ended up trying to foreclose four times. One of those times, uh, his daughter came home from school and found uh, the, the eviction notice, the foreclosure notice, I'm sorry, on, posted on the door. And so he is here trying to, he's also, he was current on his mortgage, which was, I guess, adds insult to injury. And here he is flying missions in Iraq, trying to spend his spare time on the phone with banks, trying to clear this up, uh, was unable to do so. Finally, he hired a lawyer who was familiar with the Servicemen's um, Civil Relief Act. And that lawyer uh, took seven, uh, I think, seven different times trying to find somebody, four different people, and before he could finally stop this foreclosure procedure, which was totally unjustified. So in terms of uh, the what we have been discussing earlier and the, the, the incredibly good, positive effort that Holly Petraeus is making from the CFPB in trying to deal with this, I certainly think it would be appropriate if, if this committee would use its, uh, its subpoena power and its oversight uh, responsibilities to make sure that we have all the information possible to make sure that people like Chief Warrant Officer Pickett are not abused in this way in the future. So that, if you have any comment on that. Well, I have 20 I, seconds left. I, I will just say in that very short period of time, you know, I, I think it is easy to put out of sight what the real implications are of these financial misdeeds on military readiness. Uh, the number one reason for losing a security clearance in the United States now is a problem over credit. Uh, service members who are deployed abroad have, have, have talked to us multiple times about what it means excuse me, what it means to try to fight a war on two fronts, one in a foreign location and one back at home to take care of their families. This is wrong. I thank the gentleman. <coughs> the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Gunta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, thank you very much, Professor Warren, for being here uh, today. I was been listening to the questions and the testimony, and part of the responsibility we have in this committee uh, relative to this particular hearing uh, is stated in um, the paperwork that we all received today, and I just want to read from the conclusion what it says, so we are all clear about what we should be doing. During this hearing, the committee will examine what oversight mechanisms are in place to ensure that this new government bureaucracy properly carries out its mission to protect consumers. The committee will also examine the potential uses and consequences of the CFPB's powers. And in keeping with a responsible uh, line of questioning, I think we all have uh, an obligation to ensure that the country trusts what this new entity is going to do and that there is transparency with this uh, new entity and this new agency, and that uh, we are charged with that responsibility. In the uh, last time we met, back in March, I had wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the I'm, excuse me, in uh, May 24th, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, structure and what I think is somewhat unprecedented. Um, you had stated that there is no banking regulator who is subject to the political process or to the appropriations. All banking regulators are funded independently, and indeed, all of the other banking regulators, not the consumer agency, but all of the other banking regulators, are able to set their own funding levels. Mm -hmm. um, I don't disagree with your comment in regards to the Fed, the FDIC, uh, the OCC, but I do think that there are distinctions and differences uh, between those entities and, uh, and this one. Uh -huh. So could you clarify for me? Um, if you think that there is any difference in terms of oversight and, um, and relative to the appropriations process? I, 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 I'm sorry, Congressman. I just don't know what you're driving at. I, I'm, I don't mean to be unhelpful. I just I don't know what you're driving at. Okay. Well, I'll, let me read your, your comment again. On May 24th, in the hearing that we had, you had stated, that there is no banking regulator who is subject to the political process or to appropriations. And I was making uh, the point that there is a distinction between this agency and others relative to power uh, and authority. C can you comment on that and whether you think you are uh, treated as every other banking regulator or, or if there are differences between you and other agencies? Well, I, I hope this is responsive, but please, if it is not, uh, stop me. Uh, in terms of funding, yes, we are different. We have capped funding. Other banking regulators, for example, the OCC, uh, determines funding levels and assesses financial institutions for them. Uh, uh, the FDIC follows a similar structure. Uh, the Fed, of course, gets its money in yet a different way. I'm, so uh, there, as I said in my statement, there are, there are limits on our funding. If we want funding above the cap provided in the statute, we must come back to Congress and ask Congress for an additional appropriation. That is what is provided in Dodd-Frank. And we would be permitted to do that, but it means we have to come back into the appropriations process. And, uh, as I understand it, the other bank regulators do not go into the appropriations process in order to get their funding. Would it be fair to say that the CBPB is different in the sense that, uh, with respect to the director position, uh, it, it is subject to removal only for cause uh, and is therefore exempted from president, presidential control? Uh, I I would have to go back and look at the statute again, Congressman. I think my, my concern I, I is that I, my I concern to... is this: um, it, it appears as though there is some unintended power or powers that are vested in this particular position, and that's what I would like to clarify. Because the concern I would have is an individual. I'm not talking about you personally; just the the individual who would oversee this agency would appear to have 
greater powers and authority simply by the fact that it is uh, treated differently than other banking regulators or agencies? I, I see. I, I think I understand the question. Yes, there are differences. Mm -hmm. The consumer agency is the only agency that is subject to a veto by other agencies. Um, there is no other agency subject to that kind of oversight. There is no other agency, banking agency, who, as far as I know, agency anywhere, whose rules or regulations can be uh, thrown out by a vote of other agencies. So, yes, there is a difference. Uh, the consumer agency operates under a unique constraint that is not there for others. Okay. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from <coughs> Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Quigley, I apologize. Oh. I didn't see you on the last round, so I took taking you late. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Ms. Warren. Good morning. Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, as to Mr. Cooper's comments, I think it is appropriate occasionally to catch ourselves at, at, at these uh, hearings and ask ourselves the, if we are maintaining the proper decorum and respect. I am reminded as a veteran of about 200 criminal trials that uh, cross-examination uh, can be contentious, uh, but there is a respect due to the court as there is a respect due here in our witnesses. Now, it is incumbent upon our witnesses to answer questions succinctly and forthrightly, and when they are not doing that, it is fair for the member to push them along. I would respectfully suggest that both sides have on occasion pushed the envelope on that and appeared to be disrespectful to the process and to our witnesses. So I, I think Mr. Cooper's point is well taken, and if uh, we could all move in that direction, we'd have, it would be a better body overall. Uh, Ms. Warren, uh, the salaries of your employees have been discussed, and I recognize they don't necessarily come straight from uh, the taxpayers, but they are still important. The concern I have is really toward the other end, and that is um, your ability to attract qualified employees, because you are really looking for folks who have the same knowledge set yes. of people you are regulating. Uh, I understand that in 2009, the average salary, even for the back office folks at hedge funds, was about $300,000. Uh, just the sheer volume of workers on, on the banking side and the salaries, my concern isn't so much how much your folks are making, it is your ability to attract qualified workers uh, and keep them to get the experience they need to, to do the work you are supposed to do. Is this a challenge that you see as a real problem at this point? Uh, yes, Congressman, it is a serious challenge. You know, I, I just want to be sure that we are clear on the record, since this question came up earlier. We don't set our own salaries. <clears throat> they are set by Federal statute, and we have exactly the same salary base as the Fed, as the OCC, as the other uh, uh, banking regulators. We're just we're in a system. It's what Dodd Frank requires, and we're following the law in terms of the salaries we set. But there is a serious problem right now in the regulation of financial services, and that is I, I want to put it this way: we have been genuinely blessed at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with people who have come to this agency who are incredibly smart and who have the opportunity to make lots more money somewhere else. But they truly hear the call of public service. They see an opportunity to make a real difference in a marketplace that they know, sometimes from firsthand experience, is badly broken. I worry how long we will be able to keep those people when the siren song of money from elsewhere continues to play. But it is where we are. And I say today, as much as I worry about this as a long-term problem, I am proud of every single person who has come to work for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Well, how much of this is uh, the institutional memory, given the complexities of, of the new world of finance and learning uh, how systems operate? By the time people are experienced enough to really do this competitively, they are they are really worth a lot more because of their experience with you. That's, that, that is a very fair point, Congressman. Uh, we are doing a lot of training. I want to put it this way. We invest in our people. We spend a lot of time with them on education in a formal sense. We spend a lot of time in education in an informal sense, that is, working across groups, uh, 
uh, running lots and lots of, uh, we call them lunch and learns around different topics. We think that every time we make an employee of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau smarter, it's good for the Bureau and ultimately inures to the benefit of the American people. But I recognize it also makes them a lot more attractive to people with more money. Well, and again, for the record, I have no problem with someone who is smart enough to go out in the financial world and make a good living. Uh, but given that this is a new, complex world, I am concerned that there isn't a balance here of equal experience and knowledge and understanding so that the American public isn't cheated. But I appreciate what your workers do and what, what you do. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. I, did would you, did no, you want to answer? Just, okay. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me preface my comments, uh, Professor, on, first of all, acknowledging that in your position, uh, where a lot of it is administrative, uh, you also have the responsibility to testify before Congress, and I am very grateful to you for doing this. I know that it is not always the most enjoyable part of your day, uh, but I also understand that it is necessary, and I do realize that while we not, may not always be philosophically aligned, I am grateful for your continued participation today. And to that end, I would like to ask you some questions, specifically with regard to what I think is one of the most important powers of the Dodd-Frank Act, and that is found in Section 1031, which gives the CFPB the authority to ban any products, any consumer financial product, service, or practice that it deems unfair, deceptive, or abusive. Would you agree? Uh, yes, sir. And to that end, back in uh, May, uh, May 24th, when we had the hearing here, Mr. Gowdy uh, asked you a question. Uh, as to how you would distinguish between abusive practice and non-abusive practices of these financial institutions. And, and, and the reason for that, of course, is because now that it has been in effect for a year, we are looking to make sure that consumers, as well as companies, know what to look for when they are going to be deemed uh, to either be an abusive or, or non-abusive product or service to, to the market. And now that we have had a year, I want to ask you, Again, because I believe your, your, your response in May was that we will go through the process of interpreting the language that Congress has given us. And, and I don't think that was quite where we, 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 we want to be, what we need to know. And so I want to ask you again specifically, can you name any product, service, or transaction not already illegal that is unfair, deceptive, or abusive within the meaning of the Dodd-Frank Act? Congressman, can I just start by saying we have not been in effect for a year. We have been setting up for a year. Right. We will be in effect next Thursday. Yes, ma'am. That is pretty darn close. Okay. All right. Uh, no. I will give you 51 weeks so you have been no, in effect. No, we have not been in effect. But you have had an opportunity for 51 weeks to interpret and understand the Dodd-Frank Act. And getting back to my question, please ask, answer this. Do you know of any product that is not already illegal, that is uh, unfair, deceptive, or abusive within the meaning of the Act? Congressman, I can recall no product at Have you this moment. had any discussions with your team as to any such products or how you will go about identifying such products? I have not had a discussion with, with my team about a particular product, no, sir. Don't you think that is probably one of the most important things, though? I mean, it is a power to ban, to ban, to stop the marketing in, in, of, of a certain product. Don't you think, though, that that would be something that you and your team should be addressing as you go into your first year next year? But, Congressman, I, I appreciate the advice, but actually, no. I think that what we should be doing is concentrating on the places where we can best make changes in the marketplace. And that is, for example, in our TILA RESPA form. So would it be uh, okay, Mr. then, that we just revoke the power? Congressman? Well, well I, I, mean, I don't believe me. I am being very respectful, ma'am. I am from the South. <laughs> so I, I think the point is that we are starting our work in the places that, for example, Congressman McHenry suggested was an important place to start. And that is where we can reduce. Well, we have empowered you through the Dodd Frank Act to ban any such products, and you are telling me now that you have not even given it any consideration. Would it be safe to say then that there are no such products that you are aware of that are either unfair, deceptive, or abusive within the meaning of the Act? Congressman, what I am trying yes. to describe nope. is that we have priorities. And our first priority in terms of rulemaking is around the TILA RESPA forms. We are trying to reduce regulatory burdens at the same time that we are trying to increase uh, the understanding for consumers so they can make good product choices. Professor, with respect to my time and yours, I will uh, yield the rest of my time to Mr. Gaddy so that you may adequately answer his questions. Thank you, sir. Payday lenders have a bad reputation for taking advantage of people. No one should expect to be treated well by them. Do you know who said that? Probably me. So that would be one group that should be banned? Um, Congressman, there is a lot of space 
between banning a product and making a product clearer to consumers? Um, but not including capping the interest rate. You don't have the power to do that. The, the statute is unambiguous. So you do not think payday lending should be banned? The statute is unambiguous that we have no authority to engage in uh, usury caps. That, that wasn't my question. My question was, do you think payday lending should be banned? Congressman, payday lending is one of the areas that will be under our jurisdiction. Do you think it should be banned, Professor Warren? Congressman, you just said no one should be should expect to be treated well by them. It, you also, right. you also said, subprime lending, payday, lo payday loans, and a host of predatory high interest loan products that target minority neighborhoods should be called by their true names, legally sanctioned corporate plans to steal from minorities. That sounds like a wonderful thing to ban. Or should to they be banned? or to make better. We have a whole agency and we have a whole process to work on this. We have a lot of different tools available at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. One of the advantages we have is that it is possible to work on multiple fronts at once. So with respect to Mr. Mr. Ross, Chairman, I call for I, regular I, order. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Gowdy, I apologize, but Mr. Ross's time has expired, which is why I was already gaveling. We now go to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Professor Warren. Um, I was at that hearing on May 24th and was shocked by the way you were treated. A number of us members uh, wrote to the subcommittee chairman and asked him to apologize to you, and I was curious whether or not he has extended an apology to you. No, ma'am. Um, well, on behalf of the members that found uh, that conduct um, absolutely beyond the pale in terms of professional conduct for members of Congress, uh, please accept my apology for that behavior. Um, we have spent a, a great deal of time today on uh, a number of issues that are probably premature because you are yet not operational. Um, but this committee just recently had a hearing on the Department of Education's um, regulations that they are going to impose on for-profit um, schools, universities and colleges that um, you know, provide uh, not only an education, but also um, do have um, financing through the Federal Government through Pell Grants and the like. Um, one of these for-profit uh, colleges, Kaplan University's training manu manual entitled, quote, Military E-Learning Modules, tells recruiters how to utilize fear, uncertainty and doubt in the sales process with regard to competitors' offerings and teaches them how to overcome objections that potential students may raise to signing an enrollment agreement. The document states this technique was originally created within the computer hardware industry and uses these emotions to attempt to influence perception or beliefs. The technique is especially effective when prospects introduce the need to examine other online schools. Now, this is particularly targeted, again, at our military. Um, that, coupled with the fact that not only um, are we talking about a few incidents of military um, members, uh, typically abroad, who have been foreclosed on, uh, we are talking about J.P. Morgan, who has foreclosed on 4,000 active duty uh, members of the military, has made $2 million in refunds, and has paid a $56 million um, fine, Wells Fargo that has admitted to 55,000. Now, back in January, I joined, um, asked a number of colleagues to join in a letter to uh, Mr. Bernanke and also to uh, John Walsh, the acting comptroller of the currency, asking them to audit these very banks. Um, I have not yet heard from any of them. Um, and yet, to my surprise and delight, you have already undertaken to do this uh, within the Consumer uh, Protection Bureau. So uh, my question to you is, Will you also look at this issue as it relates to military service members? Uh, yes, ma'am, we will. Uh, starting next week, on Thursday, July 21st, we will receive transferred authorities from the other agencies that have been uh, responsible before for uh, uh, the uh, consumer financial protection laws. They will come to the new consumer agency, and we will be in the largest financial institutions 
uh, engaging in on-the-ground supervision of uh, whether or not they are following the law uh, as regards different uh, consumer financial products. Um, over, remember, I, I want to be clear about our approach. We are not safety and soundness uh, supervisors. We are there to examine consumer products and examine to see whether or not the uh, financial institutions have put appropriate procedures in place to assure that they are following the law and that they are, in fact, carrying out those procedures and are in compliance with the law. That will be our job. We will be there. We will be cops on the beat to do that starting next week. Now, as I understand it, not only can these financial institutions not foreclose on military service members, but they cannot charge more than a 6 percent interest rate. Will you be looking at that issue as now, well? Congresswoman, I, I should make a caveat here. It is the Department of Defense and not the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that is specifically responsible for the enforcement of the Service uh, Member Civil Relief Act. And so what we, our, our statutory part will be around truth in lending uh, and other parts of the statutes uh, for consumer financial protection. But we will be working closely over a long period of time with the Department of Defense to gather appropriate information through different channels and to be able to work with them in a, um, a way that makes, um, uh, makes us understand the problems better and make sure there is more uh, vigorous enforcement of current laws. Thank you. My time has expired. I thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford, for five minutes. Mr. Warren, honored for you to be able to be here. Uh, you are a fellow Oklahoman from the 5th District of Oklahoma, and so let me say welcome to you, Thank you. Uh, for being here as well. Uh, let me bounce a couple of questions off of you just on some, some of the structure as it is coming up. Um, you have mentioned several times that the authority is coming over uh, July the 21st to the agency from the other agencies, Comptroller Currency, FDIC, wherever it may be, uh, for some of these. Do you happen to know or have you heard if, as that authority is transferring over from that agency, that agency is then downsizing as you are ramping up? Uh, have you, I, I know that is not your agency that you are that you're dealing with, but have you heard that they are downsizing to accommodate for the transfer of authority? Uh, yes, sir, we have. Indeed, there has been a, uh, if, if you permit me, there has sure. been a lot of trying to coordinate with these agencies. We have done some recruiting from these agencies. You know, there are some good on-the-ground people right. who currently work at the Fed. So who, there, are, there are some people that are downsizing. Those agencies are downsizing as you are ramping up? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me, let me, let me follow through on a couple of things. Uh, you have had great emphasis on the unregulated businesses, payday lenders. You have mentioned that a couple of times as well. Um, do, do you see a difference between engaging with a payday lender and a community bank specifically? I know the, the big banks get tagged all the time on things. I am just talking about community banks today when I am talking about banking. Do you see a difference between payday lenders and community banks um, as yes, far as sir. regulating them? It, yes, sir, I do. Will there be a, a difference in the way the two are handled? in the way that your agency will interact with payday lenders or community banks? Yes, sir, there will be. Dodd-Frank has about 100 rules this year that will be added to community banks. Uh, so between now and December 31st, they have 100 rules to be able to implement on that. Do you anticipate another series of rules on top of those coming down on community banks from the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? It, I, should, I just want to say on the 100, it is not 100 for the consumer agency. They're, they're in, no, that is what I am saying. They are already right. getting 100 in, from Dodd-Frank, not from you. That is what I am trying to say. I, if they are getting 100 already that are coming down from Dodd-Frank, when you all stand up, will there be more that will be coming to it? Uh, the one that we have teed up right now is this TILA-RESPA uh, uh, combination uh, trying to reduce the paperwork around mortgage origination, something, and I will say to you, sir, because I think it might be relevant. When we first started this process, the idea for us to put that first came from the community banks, and I asked them at many points along the line, I know there have been other changes, I know it costs every time forms are changed, right. is this something you want us to go forward with? And they have said yes. We also have, as one of our very early rulemaking obligations, we will be around payday lenders, but of course that is not, uh, I, I should say, not payday lenders, other non-bank right. uh, uh, lenders 
other than payday, because paydays automatically covered the large uh, uh, participant. But of course, that is not going to affect the community banks other than how it affects their competitive right. environment. The, the concern is, is that right now they have a lot of rules yes, that they are trying to put into place. And you know well community banking. Uh, that is not some large bank with a New York headquarters. This is 12 people in a small town in Oklahoma that yes, they are trying to go implement 100 rules and figure out how to do it, and it is very overwhelming. So while the rules come down and say that is not a big rule, it is not the size of each rule, it is the stack of all the rules that are coming down on them. What I am asking of you is, in the days ahead, will you please make sure that is coordinated, that there is not just saying, oh, we just added 20 new rules to them. At the same time, OCC added 20 and FDIC added 100, and then suddenly they are getting overwhelmed in a small community bank. If you would make sure those things are coordinated, that would be very helpful to them to be able to continue to have a, a free flow of credit going on. Let me, let me ask yes, you as sir. well on, on the way that you will interact with the banks also. Uh, you made a statement uh, that one of my community bankers notified me on informs business. Uh, that there may be an exam every two years on the banks from, the, uh, from your bureau. Do you anticipate also engaging in a, as a bank examiner role, not for safety and soundness, but for consumer protection, that there will also be an audit of each bank from your agency? I am sorry, sir. That is for the 111 largest financial institutions, okay. not for the community banks. So community banks not, should not be concerned on that. We, we are not the supervisor for the, for the community banks. Okay. But as far as engaging and doing auditing and stepping in and being another person that is on the ground for them will not be? As they have explained to me, they have run out of chairs for that kind they of thing. They absolutely so, have. It's, it's, yes, they sir. have uh, just about every week they have another auditor that is sitting there. So they might as well leave a, a, an office set aside for the Federal Government because right. there is going to be somebody there the next time. Do you, do you have a concern with the authority that has been given to, your, to the specific director to kind of determine products and services that are unfair? that the next director has that same authority to come undo what you do on that? I, I, I think we overstate the power of the director. There is a whole process in place for this that starts with research, that starts with community outreach, that um, uh, goes into analysis of market that has cost and benefit. There is a, a big process uh, in an agency before we get to a place where any rule, whatever it is on, uh, can be issued. As I started to say earlier, just so you get an idea about how this agency functions, half of our entire budget and our FTE will be about supervision and enforcement, supervision of the largest financial institutions and supervision of the non-bank financial institutions, and straightforward enforcing the law. About a quarter will be around consumer education, which we haven't talked about much today, and consumer complaint. And the last quarter has to cover everything else. Um, writing rules is just one piece of how we can help make this market work better for American families. I have given you our first priorities. That is where we intend to go. And we want to do that in conjunction with community banks all around the country. Terrific. Thank you. The, gen the gentleman's time has expired. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Uh, I want to announce uh, that uh, when we have when we've completed with Professor Warren, we will take a recess of between 10 and 15 minutes. I estimate that, that that will occur within about 20 minutes based on the number of members here. And I don't think I can accurately give everyone a half an hour notice, but my intention is to, in fact, allow us to work through uh, Professor Warren's completion, dismiss our witness, and uh, we will take a recess of not more than 15 minutes and then reconvene for the vote. Uh, related to the earlier motion. So I hope everyone's comfortable with that. If people feel they need a half hour notice, they have it. Uh, but it, depending upon people coming back, they may choose to then ask questions so they actually could make it longer. But I, I want to make sure that you have been very kind with your time and, and, and answers. Hopefully we have been kind back, uh, that we get through it and allow you to get on with your day and we will get on with our procedures. So with that, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes, Mr. Thank Connelly. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Professor Warren. It's good to see you again. And um, um, let me ask you a question: um, the the agency uh, you are representing here today, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, was created how? It, by Congress. No, no, but I mean in in a piece of legislation. Oh yes, the Dodd Frank Act. The Dodd Frank Act. Sorry, sir. <laughs> and did that uh, did that act pass with uh, overwhelming bipartisan support? Uh, no, sir. I. It, it passed, and I believe there were 
there was some bipartisan support, but I don't think it was overwhelming. Uh, how is uh, tell us about the governance of the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Well, uh, it's set up uh, to uh, have uh, 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 oversight in terms of its money. Its budget is set up outside the political process, like other banking regulators, so that um, uh, it receives a capped amount of money from the Fed. Yes. It but, has to, but actually, I'm, ask, I'm asking sorry. more about the actual governance. For example, are you appointed by the President? Uh, oh, I'm, I apologize. That's all right. uh, I currently am the uh, special uh, advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury for standing up the consumer agency. Uh, there will be a nominee from the President of the United States, and there will be advice and consent, presumably, from the Senate on that nominee. Are there other uh, members of the board who are also appointed and subject to confirmation? Uh, that is the only uh, uh, Senate confirmable, uh, or I, I should say presidential appointment in the consumer finance. And on a bipartisan basis in the other body, has there been indication that they are willing and receptive to the idea of such an appointment and are ready to act on it? Uh, I have seen a letter that says that 44 senators will block any nominee uh, to head up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau unless the bureau is substantially changed. From the Dodd-Frank legislation? Yes, sir. Which passed into law, but not with much of a bipartisan vote, as you indicated? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I just want to say uh, I, I listen carefully with rapt attention to our colleague and friend from Tennessee admonishing this committee, especially the junior members of this committee, uh, for lack of civility and for partisanship. Uh, with all respect, uh, the tone of partisanship and civility is not set by the junior members of this committee, it is set by the senior members of this committee. Uh, they are the ones, at the end of the day, who make the rules, enforce the rules. Uh, and engage in certain practices or not. And, uh, and, and frankly, while I also regret how you were treated before the subcommittee of this committee, Professor Warren, um, I think the issue of, of civility toward you begs the question, because what we are really up against is a relentless attack on the creation of your bureau, of the uh, of the legislation that created that bureau, even to the point of blocking any nominee, every single Republican in the Senate signed that letter you re referenced saying they will, they will move to block any nominee uh, of the President's. Uh, so if we can't win legislatively, we are going to use other mechanisms uh, to make sure that your mandate is not enforced uh, and that you can't really do your job. And so while I wish the problem were just one of civility, it goes far deeper than that. Uh, it is, in fact, a political attempt to prevent uh, the protection of consumers the legislation foresaw uh, and tried to create a framework for. Um, I deeply regret that because I think you could provide enormous visionary leadership in protecting the consumers of America. And I deeply regret that one party decided to make that a partisan issue uh, rather than try to come together and find common ground. With that, I yield back. Yes, I happily yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, add on to what uh, the gentleman just said. I want to associate myself with his words. Um, Ms. Warren, we, um, there is absolutely no doubt that you bring to this agency something that is so very, very important and that is passion. And I say to my children, I say to them, if you can take what you believe to be your purpose in life and then match it up with a job, then you are truly blessed. And you bring that passion, uh, competence, and integrity, and we, we really do appreciate you. And just in case I don't have a chance to say that again on the record, I want to make that very, very clear. The gentleman's time has expired. Dr. Gosar is recognized for five minutes. Hi, Ms. Warren. I, I'm one of the junior members, too. Um, and I'm from the private sector. I, I'm a dentist. So some of this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but I also come with a different set of eyesights, too, is that um, when you're at the dance, it always takes two parties to dance. 
and that there's problems not just from the private sector and wrongdoing, but also from government. And that's why I come with a different eyesight. I, I, I'm also from Arizona, so just to give you some perspective. So the way I look at things and the way I've seen things is that legislation, when it comes into new existence, is, isn't always perfect. And so what we're, we're straining here with, and me as one of them, is was that legislation crafted right? Did it have its proper checks and balances? And I think, I hope, and I extend, that's what the tenor is there, is that question. And when you don't get a, an answer to a question, it, it just creates more questions. I hope you understand, okay? So with that being said, I, I, I heard you talk to Mr. Gowdy um, that no product should be banned, okay? I, I thought I heard that you didn't uh, say any product should be banned. No, Congressman, I, I hope what I said is that I have been in hearings before. The President of the American Bankers Association has been asked, are there products that should be banned? He said yes. I said I think the way we should go is I think we should start with much clearer disclosure. I don't think it is appropriate to take any tool off the table. Oh, well, that, Depends I, I, on what happens. I love where you are going with this. Good. Because I, what I would love to do is I would like to see us kind of work in. This is a new agency. It has got Good. some bright, breadth of powers. So with that being said, I mean, so would you endorse repealing the specific power of Dodd-Frank? To that, to, to that degree, that you could not ban any specific um, item? No, Congressman. You wouldn't no. repeal it? No. So the language of that, uh, that, uh, that, that power, that law is perfect? Well, uh, Congressman, I wouldn't repeal the, giving the agency the powers that Dodd-Frank has given it. You know, I, I think what we ought to do is we ought to get out there and get well, started on behalf of the American but people. But I am a businessman, too, and, and the last job numbers I saw are just plummeting. And part of that is, is the uncertainty we are creating in here. And to have one individual truly heading an agency, dictating that there won't be a product, creates some uncertainty into the markets. And so you can see, understand where me as a businessman mm, doesn't like that, right? Actually, I, I do have a little problem with why you wouldn't like that, because where we are starting, and we have made clear, our initial regulatory actions with the help of the consumer, uh, with the community banks, is that we are actually going to change the law in a way that reduces the regulatory burden for these community banks, and at the same time, increases the ability of customers to read and understand a mortgage. You have seen oh, that stack. I, I, well, I, I love where you are going here. And sorry again, I am going to interrupt. Uh -huh. I am not being rude, no, but no. I got so little time here. Okay? Um, I also told you I am from Arizona. And Ms. Burke will talk to you, and you gave her some answers that you have had an outreach, a lot of support from a lot of different perspectives, mm -hmm. big banks, community banks. Can you specifically tell me which banks those are, the community banks? Sure. Uh, and on what see, product got are you are Roger the Beveridge at the Oklahoma Bankers Association. Uh, I met with Roger and probably 25 bankers on the very first day I was in office. They were here visiting from and, Oklahoma. And you have letters of support from all of those? Well, I have got Roger's their leader. I don't know how every single one of them feels. But how about, let me, can I ask you a question? I know we talked about the housing market. And could you agree that Arizona is one of the epicenters for a problem with mortgages and, and, and home, home crisis, would you say? There's, there are some terrible problems on mortgage foreclosures can you give me, in Arizona. Give me some examples of some groups that you have reached out into Arizona, because it seems to me if we have got a problem of a magnitude like this that you would reach out and you have some support in Arizona. Could you tell me specifically? And, and, and throw a couple of community banks in, if you could. Congressman, I have talked with community bankers in all 50 states, including community bankers in Arizona. But I'm afraid I'm not good enough to remember. I'd love to know the names who they are. Everyone. And, and, and why I ask is, is that we've had to have outreach. Um, I'm from one of the poorest districts in the country. I have lots of Native Americans, have a lot of veterans, I have a lot of senior citizens, a, a lot of folks that. Um, um, you're, this agency is really easy in my district because there are no choices. You cannot um, refinance your house. Right now, most of the people are living not paying their mortgages, and the banks aren't even putting it on their lists because they can't take it as another hit. And I'm not finding, um, from my standpoint in District 1, any banks that have, have been contacted in my district from you. And I'd love to know who they are to, that we would find out and get a list from you, if we could. Thank you. If, if, uh, the former chairman, Mr. Towns, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, 
Let me begin by saying that I've heard some of my colleagues, you know, um, the concern about the salary of the workers. Let me say to you that I applaud you uh, for really paying wages that you can keep people to be able to do the kind of job that needs to be done. And I think that if we look back and if we're honest, that I think some of our problems have been is because we did not pay people that had oversight responsibility the way we should have paid them, and that led to some of the problems. I do believe that. I have not done any research on it, but I do think that that is an issue. But at least you have the insight and understanding to pay people so you will be able to hold on to them to be able to do the job that needs to be done to bring about the confidence that needs to happen in order for us to be able to move forward from this point on. So I want to go on record saying I salute you, you know, for doing that. And, 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 and of course, um, uh, I was in Afghanistan not too long ago, and I had an opportunity to talk to many of the soldiers. And um, their real concern was about the fact that they were having difficulty maintaining their homes. And they gave me stories like, for instance, that they were stationed in one place, transferred them out, and then, of course, they had a house there, and now they are uh, moving again. And, and what do, can we do? How could you be helpful to us? So that was the cry, outcry that was coming from many, many of the soldiers as we talked and walked in Afghanistan. Uh, and um, to me, uh, I think that we have an obligation and responsibility to do something about it. What suggestions do you have? Well, Congressman, I, I, I will start by saying you are really showing how we are all paying a price for a broken consumer credit system that letting things get as far out of control as they got in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, and now, now we pay. Um, at a minimum, what we can work on at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is giving service members and veterans a place to come, uh, a place that we can at least get a better understanding of what is wrong, to work with the Department of Defense to make sure that the Service Members Relief Act is fully and fairly enforced, that other tools that are available to us, like truth and lending, are also fully and fairly enforced, um, and to make this issue a national priority for America. You know, we have done a lot to heal other segments in the economy, but we have not focused on the impact on our service members of a broken credit market, and we must do better. I really appreciate you focusing on it. And let me again uh, thank you and, of course, uh, Professor Warren and, and, uh, and Mrs. Petraeus for your efforts to bring accountability to the banks that unlawfully foreclose on service members, especially during the course of deployment. I want to do that. And on July the 6, 2011, uh, Ms. Petraeus announced that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Judge Advocate General of the United States Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard agreed to a number of steps to provide stronger protections for service members and their families. Is that right? Yes, sir. One important aspect of this has to be education. But another aspect has to be enforcement. When Mrs. Petraeus appeared at the forum on Tuesday, uh, she emphasized this. Here is what she said. Let me go and repeat. Um, quote, you can have the laws in place, but if the people on the other end of the phone are not aware of them or are not applying them properly, then it is not going to work. What is your reaction? I think that is absolutely certain, Congressman. Uh, she speaks truth on this. You know, one of the things I want to say about the Consumer Bureau, I'll just say it again quickly, half of all of our money, our, our employees eventually, will be in supervision and enforcement, not in trying to change rules, but in making sure that the law is enforced. A quarter of our people will be in financial education and consumer complaint, dealing right on the ground with families. And the remaining quarter